at 210 miles an hour, man must be ready for the split-second decisions that determine his destiny. The lineage of champions extends back 77 years. The man who wins today writes his name in history to join 52 others with the title champion of the Indianapolis 500. It's expected that nearly half a million people will fill these giant grandstands in the world's largest stadium. Absolutely packed today, all here with the same thought in mind to watch the 72nd running of the Indianapolis 500. The cars already in position on the straightaway and ready for the start of the 500. Well, hello, I'm Paul Page in the pit area at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and this is the world's largest single-day sporting event. The process began, though, three weeks ago, 11 days of practice, four days of time trials, 92 cars and 51 drivers showed up here, and we have sorted down now, and we have the fastest 33 ready to go racing for 500 miles on a Sunday afternoon in Indiana. Now, when you joined us just seconds ago, you joined a, a worldwide audience of race fans, all interested in this single, this pinnacle day in motorsports, the Indianapolis 500 itself. They move to their seats now, each with their own little traditions and rituals, ready to watch the start and the running of this great 500-mile race. The cars sit empty now, but in just under one hour, 11 rows of three will roll toward the green flag. They will be led by pole sitter Rick Mears. The two-time champion and his wife, Chris, enjoy getting away from the crowd. But today, he is the focus of millions of fans. His Penske Chevrolet broke all the records. From waiter to taxi driver to rub shoulders with the Hollywood stars, Danny Sullivan spun, then won the 1985 race. He starts the second Penske car. Al Unser's second love is snowmobiling in Chama, New Mexico. But the defending champion's life is his four Indy wins. He'll start outside the first row. Mario Andretti is the only American to win the World Driving Championship, the Daytona, and the Indianapolis 500. Al Unser Jr. raced go-karts at age nine. Today, 17 years later, he follows in his father's footsteps. For Ari Leyendijk, a native of Holland, the outside of the second row is his best Indy starting position in four years of racing here. Scott Brayton's father was a race driver. This bachelor from Coldwater, Michigan has raced here now for seven years. Emerson Fittipaldi of Brazil retired from the glamorous world of Formula One, but found new life and joy in the IndyCars. 
Born Derek Patrick Daly in Dublin, Ireland 35 years ago. Married, he now lives near Indianapolis. 25-year-old Michael Andretti, Mario's son, a reflection of his father's image and skill. Along with his wife, Debbie, Californian Randy Lewis is one of the best salesmen in racing. He holds a degree in marketing from the University of California. Roberto Guerrero, nine months ago, lay in a coma for 17 days as a result of a crash here in private practice. Kevin Cogan is a newlywed. Tom Sneva, a former high school principal. With little help to finance his team, Phil Kruger works on his own car. At 54, Dick Simon is the oldest driver in the race. Italian tail Bobby runs his family's mining business. And Jim Crawford and his wife Sheila are expecting their first child. 12 handicap golfer Bobby Rahal, the 86th champion, has never started this far back in the field. Brazilian Raul Boisel is a former show horse jumper. Californian Dominic Dobson is the fastest rookie ever in the 500. Outdoorsman, businessman, grand champion, A.J. Foyt starts his 31st 500 at age 53. Billy Vukovic, the first third generation driver in the 500. And Tony Bettenhausen, the son and namesake of another great 500 driver. Carol Palmroth, the first 500 driver from Finland. Steve Chassie, the only Vietnam veteran in the race. And rookie John Andretti, Mario's nephew. Rocky Moran is also an executive jet pilot. Stan Fox drives one of A.J. Boyd's cars. And Johnny Rutherford in his 24th race looks for a fourth Indy win. Canadian Ludwig Heimrath Jr. starts his second 500. Rich Vogler is the man who bumped two-time winner Gordon Johncock from the field. And starting last, Howdy Holmes is back for his first race since 85. This is the most important day in the racing year, the biggest day in the driver's life. While most people are off work today, 33 will spend their day hard on labor. And the drivers begin to prepare early. We followed several of the drivers right from the morning. Early this morning, we began to follow Danny Sullivan. He was awake as the sun came up. By 7.30, he was shaving and beginning to contemplate the day. It was a cup of tea, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and some granola for breakfast. And then, just before 8.30, across to the garage area itself. There he was greeted by his mom, Peggy, who had a bag of cookies for her. And then, Danny Sullivan was alone with his thoughts. But now, live, he's with Brian Hammond. Paul Danny Sullivan is now in his garage, dressed in what today will be his work clothes. Not a suit and tie today, but three-ply fireproof Nomex. He's going over the game plan in his mind. He's been over it a hundred times. And in just a little while, it will be time for Danny Sullivan to put that game plan to task. Paul? Well, right now, we're 38 minutes from the start of engines. In just a moment, we'll visit the winningest team ever at Indy, Penske Racing holders of the entire front row and we'll look back on the month of May here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The Indianapolis 500 is brought to you by the way almost clear now as the giant crowd has moved into the grounds many sit on top of vans and trailers others have uh, more luxurious accommodations at the indianapolis 500 you know here the seats are handed down from generation to generation and i'm proud to report that abc sports is continuing in that tradition because we've just signed a brand new contract to cover the indianapolis 500 live for the next four years now let's consider the front row the penske team Roger Penske, the car owner, on each of those cars in the front row. Consider the positions. Rick Mears on the pole, then Danny Sullivan and Al Unser, Jr. Roger Penske is the winningest car owner at the Indianapolis 500. He may win yet today. Earlier, my colleague Sam Posey took a look at this most remarkable man. Winning is, is a term that I guess uh, manifested itself uh, throughout you know, our society for a number of years. And it is an indicator. You know, you win or you lose. This was Roger Searle Penske at the Culver Military Academy. Notice his cap is at just the right angle. The next step was Lehigh University, where he majored in industrial management. His interest in sports cars drew him to racing, and his disciplined, organized approach to the sport made him a winner of major races in the early 1960s. At 28, Roger cut short his budding driving career to enter the business world. He began with a Chevrolet dealership in South Philadelphia. His rise, swift and sure, was built on 18-hour workdays, high mobility via a pair of Lear jets, 
and a way of looking at things dead in the eye with a total absence of emotion. Today, the Penske Corporation grosses over a billion dollars a year. Roger runs the biggest Toyota and Cadillac dealerships in America, the Hertz Penske Truck Leasing Company, Detroit Diesel, a joint venture with General Motors, the race team, and two race tracks. There are other corporate millionaires, of course, and a few of them are involved in racing. But Roger is unique in that he was a racer first and a businessman second. And even today, racing is the thread that runs through everything he does. Well, I think the big thing in racing, they don't wait for you. There's no excuses, and you have to make it happen. If you're at Indianapolis and you're three or four miles an hour slow in qualifications the next morning, you've got to do something about it. And typically, it's, uh, you know, you don't wait for the phone to ring. You know, you're, you're more proactive, and I think that's kind of the uh, way we feel in, in racing. There's a lot of follow-up. You're sure that things happen. And typically, those kind of disciplines you don't find in, in many businesses. If you work hard for something, you're usually successful. The best athletes are the ones that train, that have discipline. Uh, the top business managers that I've met uh, throughout the country are the ones that uh, are putting the time in or interfacing you know, with their people, with their customers. And it works. It's, it's, it's the old-fashioned way, I guess. Hey, nice to see you back in California, huh? Bill at the Hertz Penske. He leads by example, setting personal standards for effort and commitment which do not go unnoticed by the people, famous or otherwise, that he employs. The amazing thing about Roger is his attention to detail, and it doesn't matter whether it's the race shop, the race cars, the Hertz Penske, the dealerships, they're all immaculately clean. Everything is perfect. He's, you know, probably as straight a shooter as I've seen in the business. I mean, he's a tough businessman. And, uh, you know, if he's going to make a deal, he's going to make a good deal. But it's usually a good deal for both parties. Even the people that don't have day-to-day -day contact with him feel his influence. I know Roger's in charge. You can see the difference already in the plan. It was quite pessimistic before Roger took over. We were all wondering what we're going to do a year from now. But now there's hope for the future. If there's one thing that's essential to his success that Roger himself thinks of as the key, it is... Teamwork. If someone said, what'd you think about sitting three cars on the front row in Indianapolis? What I felt was how great that was for the eight or 9,000 people that work for us, that they, it's their cars on that front row. And that would just manifest itself into pulling that whole team together. It's a common thread through our organization. As I'm setting standards and goals every day for our people, and this is high profile, and uh, to go out there and fall on your face, uh, I fog a lot harder than most people think uh, when we're not successful. Uh, as far as uh, Indianapolis, if we're not, we don't go there to win, and we shouldn't go. And there is Roger Penske live, no doubt wondering, can his cars finish one, two, and three today? Now, Danny Sullivan is now beginning to leave the garage area. There he is, walking alone, few friends behind, acknowledging those that are saying hello and wishing him luck. Julie Nimmy comes out to the pits with him. Yeah, how about you? You going out? I came out to see if you need somebody to walk out with. And the other Penske driver, the pole sitter, Rick Mears, still in the garage area and with Jack Aroot. And Rick Mears will be following his teammate, Danny Sullivan, out in that long walk very shortly as Chris Mears there in the background getting ready for, to make the walk out with her husband. But for Rick Mears, the countdown continues, Rick, and what is the greatest day in your life, I suppose? Your last-minute thoughts. Well, basically, we're just uh, trying to relax a little bit and uh, stay in out of the heat as much as possible. It's going to be a warm day today and very slippery, so just basically trying to relax. And uh, once we get out there to the car, then we'll start thinking about what's going to happen on the start. Your teammates flank you on the outside in the middle of that front row. Any thoughts or concerns about the start? Not really. I think, you know, maybe it's a little relaxing having your teammates there, and it's just going to be, you know, get off to a smooth start, and uh, whoever gets to the corner first is going to take the lead, and the rest fall in line. So that's really kind of the game plan for now. Well, Rick Mears is ready, Paul, ready for the Indy 500. Danny Sullivan continues his walk out to the pit area at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And this is his destination, the starting grid, the main straightaway at Indianapolis. You know, this once a year meeting takes nearly a month. To look at this month past, here again is Jack Aroot. 
Like other Mays at Indy, the hunt has been for speed. Initially, the title of fastest went back and forth between Mario Andretti and Rick Mears. The quest for quickness, though, sometimes had a sting. Roberto Guerrero spinning in the same part of the track where a catastrophic testing accident nearly took his life eight months ago. This time he was shaken, but uninjured. For many of the drivers here, like Derek Daly, it's one tough month. There's nothing glamorous about being there every day and pounding around and trying to get the car to go faster. The best part about the month of May, I think, is the anticipation of race day. On the eve of the first qualifying day, the andretti Mears duel reached a standoff when Mario and then Rick posted identical laps of 221.456 miles per hour. When I see Rick and uh, Mario do their 220s, I gasp for a minute and think, you know, that's incredible. I didn't really expect him to do that. Others, like Bobby Rahal, were finding it hard just to get going, much less go 220. For the men behind the cars, it meant working into the early hours of qualifying day, looking for that exclusive extra mile per hour. Pole day is a time for huge crowds to bake in the sun and for race teams to make final preparations and hope. It's nerve-wracking, uh, particularly if you only have one car, as a lot of people have. It's up to me to make the most of it. Andretti faltered on his pole run and left the stage to Rick Mears. Mears' pole-winning effort capped an unprecedented sweep of the 500's front row by car owner Roger Penske. Although a driver is alone when he tries to run the four fastest laps he can, it affects many. The emotions at the time, particularly in qualifying, affect the people that are with the team and associated with the team like Beth would have an emotional high on qualifying day more so than I did. If, from my point of view, it was almost a relief that it was over. Qualifying for the 500 is only part of the task in May. Public appearances and numerous seminars with sponsors are all part of whether a driver makes the grade. There are moments to enjoy the good life and the celebrity status. But sometimes, for others, like three-time 500 winner Johnny Rutherford, simply making the field is a struggle. Or like Pancho Carter, who pushed beyond the limit. Look plays a great part in it. Um, to go fast enough to qualify, you must put the car on the limit. To put the car on the limit, you risk not ever making the race. Carter would destroy two cars within hours of each other on the second to last day of qualifying. And he ends up a spectator for this year's event. During the final moments of qualifying, two-time 500 winner Gordon Johncock saw his car bump from the field by a last-second run by Rich Vogler. The same man that just moments before John Cox bumped from the field. So now the exclusive group of 33 is complete. Derek Daly and the rest know only one will win. For anybody that wins it, it's a life-changing event. They would look back on that one day, and it will be the focal point of their life till the day they die. Well, many are asking if the Penske cars can hold off the other 30. Right now, it's empty cockpits, waiting, quiet motors. Brian Hammonds continues to follow Danny Sullivan as he counts the minutes to the start. Danny, a lot of drivers wait until the very last moment to come out. There are a lot of people that want your time. There's a lot of distractions. Why come out so early? Well, I just get too antsy sitting around back in there and thinking about too many things. I get a few distractions out here, plus it's real hot. Gives me a little time to get used to being in the suit and uh, get a little sweat going. Outwardly, you look very calm, very relaxed. Are you? <laughs> I wish that was the case. I got a, a lot of butterflies going right now and, and a thousand thoughts about what to do. Well, at least outwardly, Danny Sullivan looks about as relaxed as one can expect to look, considering he's going racing in Indianapolis. Paul? Well, we're about 20 minutes now from the start of the engines as A.J. Boyd walks out of the garage area looking at his 31st consecutive Indianapolis 500-mile race. The grand champion, the first four-time winner. A.J. Foyt, his last minutes with friends. Soon he will be alone. Thank you. Well, the fans at this great speedway, they have an opportunity to buy a final souvenir. But in a moment, we'll look at the most dangerous moment in the race, the start. And then we'll meet one of the loveliest ladies in racing, Katie Guerrero. 
Final ceremony is continuing at the speedway. About 20 minutes to go to the start of the engines. Roberto Guerrero's machine so different from Ray Haroon's Marmon Wasp. Last fall, we feared Roberto Guerrero might not climb into that cockpit today, but he did so with the help of his wife, Katie Guerrero. Here's Sam Posey. In 1987, Roberto Guerrero was having the season of his life. He won two races. He was leading the Indy 500 when his clutch failed, and he still finished second. It was a summer of happiness shared with his wife, Katie, and their son, Marco. They had just found out Katie was pregnant with their second child. And then Katie and Roberto's lives were changed. Roberto Guerrero has crashed in turn two. He remains unconscious, uh, still in critical condition. His vital signs uh, remain stable. The best thing that we have to report today is that he began to respond to simple commands. Roberto, I, I know you can hear me, but don't get frustrated. You'll be fine with time. Roberto Guerrero had crashed during testing at Indianapolis. He would be in a coma for 17 days. It was almost beyond comprehension for, for me to think that he was there laying there fighting, fighting for his life. When Roberto awoke, he learned that Katie had rarely left his side. Doctors credit her presence with helping bring him around. She credits their son, Marco. He didn't have a lot of expression at first, but he had the very most expression that he had of all when he saw Marco, which was really neat. Back at home in California, Roberto worked five hours a day on a computer to retrain his responses, always looking to the day when he would climb back in a racing car, because for Katie and Roberto, there was never a thought of his quitting. Racing is something that's meant so much to me all my life that I think I would be a miserable person if I didn't race anymore. I just wouldn't be very happy at all. I don't know what I would do. So, you know, for the moment, I guess I'll keep doing it. It's something that he loves so much, and it's something that makes him so happy that I, I wouldn't take that away from him. Katie and Roberto met seven years ago on a yacht in Monaco, but they have never been more in love than they are today. It's hard to explain him, but he is the most loving and giving person that I've ever met. I feel very lucky in having the family that I have. I feel, I feel very blessed as well. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the happiest guy in the world. Katie and Roberto Guerrero have traveled a lifetime from a hospital room last October to the Indy 500 today. And they are thankful just to have made the journey. Katie Guerrero, now live, truly a loving human being as she thinks ahead to the start of the 500. Well, the crowd anticipates the start of the engine, but as the field rolls toward that starting stand, well, we all hold our breath. It is the most dangerous moment. 33 cars maneuvering at 200 miles an hour and inches apart. Here again is Sam Posey. Unleashing the starting field of the Indy 500 has always been a tricky business. 33 cars and drivers as tightly bunched as rush hour traffic, accelerating from 80 miles an hour to over 200 with no way to rehearse, no way to plan for what will happen. When the start goes smoothly, it is a thing of beauty, an affirmation of the driver's skill and judgment. But when it goes wrong, and it often has, it strikes terror in the heart. An image of chaos, vivid and unforgettable, is etched in our minds. Racing all at once seems stupid and futile, an extravagant waste. It is not surprising, therefore, that the officials of the Indy 500 have through the years done their best to develop a starting procedure that minimizes the risks. Chief Steward Tom Binford describes it. I listen to my pace car steward tell me how they're doing. I watch the monitor on TV. When they come out of the fourth turn, I take over uh, visually and determine whether they're, they're in sufficient formation, they're coming down fast enough, it looks like it'll be a safe start. If it is, then I uh, punch the green button, the green light comes on, Sweeney raises his uh, green flag. And if they're not in formation, then the yellow light uh, will remain on and Sweeney will wave the yellow flag and they will go around and try it again. What matters the most is where you are in the field. Pole sitter Rick Mears explains. 
the front row is great because it's, it's a safer place and to be at the start of the race. As far as, you know, what I try to do is, obviously you try to get the jump on everybody else, you know, to get into the first turn first. And that's, that's key at the start is the, the initial movement to get the momentum going. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then uh, I just look for the closest available slot to slide into safely. Starting up front is very different from starting in the pack, as Phil Kruger is about to. To start with uh, just, just the congestion and the visibility problems uh, through turbulence and the problems with turbulence uh, affecting the car are, are, just, uh, are just not fun, and, and really it's just survival. That's the only thing that, that I think about the first few laps of survival. Get through those laps clean without any damage to the car, and then, after the two laps, it's get to the 300-mile mark. The start, the most critical moment of the race. And, of course, the objective to get through that first turn safely. This is the garage area, gasoline alley. For the most part, it is empty right now. Here is one of the last drivers to walk out as, again, live, we watch Mario Andretti. After 19 years and his last win, will today be his second 500 victory? <laughs> Gasoline Alley, leading out to the track itself. Mario hesitates for just a moment. It's astounding how truly calm they appear as they walk toward their cars. the first contact with this giant crowd. Minutes to go to the green flag as the clock continues to count. Well, during the war years of 1942, 1945, and the track fell into disrepair until it was purchased and restored by Tony Hullman in November 1945. Trackside at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, I'm Jack Arood, and you're looking at the gigantic crowd, and there's Danny Sullivan, and some of the drivers are getting ready to strap themselves in their cars, because there's only 14 minutes left to the command to start engines. As that start draws closer, let's check in high atop the start-finish line with my colleague, Sam Posey. Thanks, Jack. This moment when the drivers are at their cars always seems so poignant to me. It's a time when, for so many of the rest of us, the long winter is finally over. The summer is almost here. We're beginning to relax a little bit, maybe break out the barbecue. But for these 33 drivers, we won't be doing any of that today. They will be putting it all on the line in the most nerve-wracking race anywhere in the world. And it's hard not to have a special feeling for each of them. Working with Paul Page and with me in the booth today will be three-time Indy winner Bobby Unser. And Bobby, of course, you've been through this many times, but I can remember in your career, you were always one of the last drivers out to the car. Uh, was that gamesmanship or what? No, it really wasn't, Sam. But just imagine, for example, if you come out in the, in the track early, you've got about 300 people shaking your hand. Just think how tired your hand would be, and you yet have to run the hardest race in the world. So that really wasn't it. It was trying to stay back in the garage and also get a little bit of peace and do a little bit of thinking. Well, they say it's going to be 85 degrees by noon today. What difference will that make? It's not going to affect the drivers. There's no humidity today, so we have a nice day there. But it will affect the cars, both because they're going to go slow in the yellow flags, but mostly because the sun is shining on the track. There are no clouds today. Beautiful day. But what's going to happen is the rubber and the oil is going to make the track slippery today. Quick word about the star. Uh, we're going to see that in just a little bit. Pinsky front row, really fast guys. Mario Andretti right behind. Mario's going to try to beat Rick to the first turn, but I don't think he's going to make it. All right. Well, it is just 12 minutes to go now before that moment when the gentlemen start their engines. The formal ceremonies leading up to the start of the 500 are virtually unchanged throughout the history of the race. They are part of the great tradition, and they are coming up next. 
You're looking at Danny Sullivan as he's about to strap himself in the car. I'm Jack Aroot. We're still trackside, and we only have six minutes to go, Paul Page. Now on the straightaway, poised, ready. Look at that magnificent assemblage of people here for the 500. But now it is the Purdue All-American Band as they begin the formal ceremonies, along with Sandy Patty and the playing of the national anthem. Of Anderson, Indiana, joins the Purdue University All-American Band in presenting our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watch were so gallant Indiana. Indiana's Sandy Patty, the national anthem. The drivers still for the moment enjoy a few moments to stand. The crowd stands as well as perhaps many of them will through the first several laps of the 500 miles. Mario Andretti. Last moments. In just a few seconds, he will strap into the cockpit of his Lola. Danny Sullivan, we've watched him throughout his morning. He is alone now. The earphones for his two-way radio blocking out the sounds. Now back to the straightaway again. The invocation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll remain standing for the invocation to be delivered today by the Most Reverend Edward T. O'Meara, Archbishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis. Good and gracious God, it is indeed proper that we pause this Memorial Weekend, for it is America's annual remembering time. May we never forget our country's fallen ones. The list of names is long and filled with pain. It includes now sailors who died in the Persian Gulf ease the pain of those who survived our country's conflicts. Watch over the men and women of our country's armed forces and make them instruments of peace. And dear my Lord, may we not forget those few Americans who are still so cruelly kept hostages. With their loved ones, we cannot rest till they are free. We ask special guidance for our president and a party first secretary. We long for trust and peace for our two great peoples. More we ask your protection for these skilled and courageous drivers, their mechanics and their crews, and for ourselves as well. Make us better because all of us have been together this day, then see us safe to our homes and continue to bless us with the beautiful weather of this glorious sunshine. Amen. Of course, there is no forgetting that this is the Memorial Day weekend. And now, ladies and, and gentlemen, will here. you please remain standing. Those who served that America might be Memorial free. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pause here 
in a moment of silence to pay homage to those individuals who have given their lives unselfishly and unafraid to make it possible for us to witness as free men the world's greatest sporting event. We also pay homage to those men who have given their lives unselfishly and without fear to make racing the world's most spectacular spectator sport. fans it's once again time for the traditional singing of back home again in indiana and once again it is my privilege to introduce to you mr jim neighbors <laughs> Home again in Indiana, and it seems that I can see the gleaming candle light still burning bright through the sycamores for me. The new morn. switch now to Jim Philippi at the head and a stream of over 25,000 multicolored balloons drift into the Indiana skies the final moment is at hand the crowd remains standing silent now anticipating the roar that is about to split the Indiana afternoon these giant grandstands filled to the brim the drivers strap in their cockpits you now look in the crew right standing there. by close and ready waiting for this no, last no, moment no, no. everyone waits the pulse quickens the heart has the beats faster this is the grandest moment in motorsports soon the 11 rows of three will unleash their furies down the main straightaway 800 left-hand turns, 200 laps, 500 miles. We go now to the pace car. For those four words that we have all been waiting to hear. To give the traditional no, command no, 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 Mary. is Chairman Emeritus of the board of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Miss Mary Hallman. Gentlemen. Start your
engines are now started on the main stretch in Indianapolis. Over 25,000 horsepower. The defending champion, Al Unzer, is ready. There's Mario Andretti. He sits to the inside of the second row and acknowledges that his engines are fired and ready. Danny Sullivan poised in the center of the front row. Al Unzer, Jr. Had a touch of the flu yesterday. Feels better this morning. And the pole sitter, Rick Mears. He holds all of the qualifying records here at the 500-mile race. Will, at the end of the day, he hold the race record. Emerson Fittipaldi, the two-time world driving champion. Visor down. Sealed off from the noise in the world. And young Michael Andretti looks ahead to where his father sits. Roberto Guerrero back in a race car after that injury last fall and on board over Danny Sullivan's shoulder there's the view will be seen throughout this race the yellow lights flicker on the pace car just ahead waiting as the engines are warmed and come up to temperature the signal will be given and the pace car will roll away the 11 rows of three are set to go Michael Andretti as you look over his right hand shoulder rows up ahead And the crew says, go Michael and good luck. As the pace car rolls out and the field begins to roll away. The second row, the third row with Derek Daly and Scotty Brayton. There goes Michael Andretti. The field now rolling three laps to the green flag. And you sit in the middle of the front row with Danny Sullivan. The pace car just up ahead. Three safety cars ahead of that. They'll drop off after the two parade laps. So let's take a look at the starting field for the 72nd running of the 500, the pole sitter, Rick Mears, then Danny Sullivan. Al Unzer celebrates his birthday today. In the second row, Mario Andretti looks for his second win, Al Unzer Jr. and Ari Leyendijk. The third row, Scott Brayton, Emerson Fittipaldi, Derek Daly. In the fourth row, Michael Andretti, Randy Lewis, Roberto Guerrero. Kevin Kogan starts on the inside of the fifth row. Former winner Tom Sneva and Phil Kruger hopes for a win. In the sixth row, it's Dick Simon, Teo Fabi, and Scotland's Jimmy Crawford. Bobby Rahal, the 86th champion, on the inside of the seventh row. Raul Boisel, and the fastest rookie ever at the 500, Dominic Thompson. The eighth row, starting his 31st race, a four-time winner, A.J. Boyd, and a rookie, son, of a two grandson of a two-time winner, Billy Vukovich, then Tony Bettenhausen, the ninth row, Carol Palmrod, Steve Chassie, and John Andretti. The tenth row is Rocky Moran, a rookie. Stan Fox, three-time winner, Johnny Rutherford. The eleventh row, Ludwig Heimrath Jr., Rich Vogler, and Howdy Holmes. The starting field for the Indianapolis 500 as you look backwards from Michael Andretti's car, the camera mounted on the gearbox and underneath the rear wing, looking back to the cars coming up alongside Randy Lewis and the rest. And there over the right-hand shoulder of Mario Andretti. And on board with Danny Sullivan as you watch him manipulate the steering wheel. Magnificent onboard cameras here to cover the 500. Let's now go to the pits, Jackaroo. And Roger Penske, you're the only man that has cars on the front row for the first time in history. Is there any strategy? Did you work something out between the three drivers for the start? Well, Jack, the first thing we did, we talked about getting a nice, clean start. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be up in front. I think that uh, it's up to our fellows to have a clean start. And if uh, Rick's in the corner first, I'm sure that the other fellows will tuck in behind. But Again, it's got to be clean, and we'll see what happens. But I'm just looking for a safe race. Well, you've got to be concerned about Mario Andretti as well. Andretti's going to be real tough today, and uh, he's a great charger. But I think he, even on the start, knows that the consequences that could happen in trying to get in the lead on the first lap are much greater than trying to win the race at the end. Believe me, there's butterflies, Paul, down here. Now Roger Penske contemplates this 500-mile race and the very real possibility of a finish, first, second, and third for the Penske team, but there are, of course, 30 others who will contest that possibility. The drivers now begin the second of their parade laps, waving to the crowd, saluting those fans who are here today. Perfectly aligned, the 11 rows of three. Let's take a look 
33 cars will start. They're looking for a little over $5 million in posted purses. The distance, 500 miles, 200 laps, and they'll be shooting for Bobby Ray Hall's 1986 race record. The makeup of the field, there are the engines and the chassis. A marvelous variety, more than we've seen in years. Several of the chassis, too, last year's models. Will it be an 87 or an 88 chassis that wins the 500? Former champions of the Indianapolis 500-mile race, of course, led by Foyt and Unser. Now, let's go down to the pits, Brian Hammonds. Paul, there was a report that A.J. Foyt was leaking fuel on the parade lap, but that has not that has not been confirmed. Jim Gilmore, the car owner, says no, everything is okay. The helmet wasn't secure at first, but now A.J., everything is fine. He's ready to go racing in Indianapolis for the 31st time. Paul, back at you upstairs. Well, the indication from race control is that there was some fuel leakage, but it should clear up and does not represent a problem. They don't anticipate an action against A.J. Foyt in the hot sun overflow of fuel Mario Andretti he looks ahead to the front row that's Rick Mears just ahead of Mario Danny Sullivan defending champion Al Unser and there's there's Danny what a magnificent shot especially when he comes past the main grandstands looking back from Michael's car Randy Lewis drops back just a bit Roberto Guerrero just off the left edge of the screen drivers now will surge forward and backward easing their own nerves. Now Michael begins to weave the car, scrub the tires clean, bring them up to temperature. Off of the fourth turn, at the conclusion of the second of two parade laps. The pace lap is about to begin. So let's take a moment, consider the start coming. First, Sam Posey. Well, Paul, I think one of the things that should be remembered is that the grid is set according to qualifying that was done two weeks and one week ago. The last time these cars have been out on the track was this Thursday. Let's look at the times that were set then because that may have more of a bearing on what happens in the next few minutes than the actual grid alignment. Mario Andretti was fastest at 215. Danny Sullivan second at 214. Rick Mears, who's our pole sitter right now, was only the third fastest at 213. So we may have a volatile situation here at the start, uh, but I tend to agree with Roger Penske's assessment that everybody is looking to make a sensible start. The first rows are all filled with experienced drivers. It's only in the back that you have rookies. Bobby, if you were in the front row, what would be your strategy? Well, obviously, like uh, Rick and Roger have said, get a good, clean start. Uh, you know, main thing is don't have any accidents because the race would be too short if you did. But right now, what you see is the cars were strung way out, halfway or a fourth of the way around the racetrack. Now they're all gathering back up. These engines don't run well at low RPMs. They need a little bit of RPM. The tires need a little bit of working to get them warmed up. Now watch them line back up. Now that's a neat lineup. The guys that are going back and forth are just trying to get the extra debris off of their tires, Paul. Well, the pace car is driven by the first fan through the sound barrier, General Chuck Yeager. The pole sitter is Rick Mears as they come through the north chute and head for the fourth turn. Back with Mario Andretti. You can see that front row well aligned. The pace begins to pick up now as Rick Mears controls the front row coming to the line. The pace car already off the track and into the pit area. Wayne Sweetie, the starter, has the green flag. They're aligned coming off the fourth turn. We look for the green flag now as there it is. And the 1988 Indianapolis 500, the 72nd running, is underway. Danny Sullivan moves to the outside and then dives into the lead in the first turn. Danny Sullivan leads coming across the short shoot. Followed by Rick Mears, Al Unser, and now Al is being challenged by his son for third place. Mario Andretti drops the fourth. Danny Sullivan leads down the back stretch. Then Mears. Now watch this fight here. Yellow flag is out as a car against the wall. Roberto Guerrero, and it looks to be Scotty Brayton. A third car is there as well. On the first lap, exactly what is the most fearsome moment of the race, what we have feared, what everyone fears. The yellow flag is out. Less than a lap is complete, and the race is running under yellow. Technically, this was not, of course, a crash on the start itself. It's uh, out on the uh, uh, turns. The sound that we hear uh, has nothing to do with the crash. It's the bombs that they send off after the start of the race. 
Bobby, we're looking at the rescue crews. They are there. They're very fast to respond. And there is Roberto Guerrero out of the car. So we've seen both Brayton and Guerrero climb out of that car. Well, the accident didn't look very serious. We haven't seen a replay yet, so we can't tell exactly what happened. But it doesn't seem like it's a very serious accident. But it's just so easy. The first turn, the first lap is always a dangerous time of the race. And all it takes is one guy not to give just a little bit to the others until they get strung out. You touch just a little bit. We had one last year with Jose Le Garza. It's a shame we had one today because it's too long a time for Roberto to be out for next year. It's too bad about Guerrero. You know, he has finished the last four consecutive Indianapolis 500. All right, we watch here. Here is one angle. You can see up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen coming off of the second turn. One car apparently losing it. Brayton and Guerrero go to the wall right in front of the corporate suites and slide along that wall. Dangerous situation here for Guerrero because he's pointed nose in the softest part of the car. And look at that Ooh. wheel bounce. That can hurt you if a wheel comes uh, up and hits you. And interestingly, as we have a look now from the race cam, this there's Scott Michael Brayton. Andretti's yep. car. That's Scotty Brayton behind. This may be the best coverage. He's already started wave. to lose it. Now he loses it sideways. Guerrero goes high. But that was the wrong direction as Scotty takes Guerrero to Brayton the wall. Brayton lost it right on the painted lines, didn't he? Exactly what happened to Danny Sullivan uh, three years ago. It's very hard with these cars, especially when the tires are still cold, to go over the paint uh, the without losing the control. There you see oh. both cars locked up. Not Guerrero's fault at all. He was taken out by Brayton, clear as a bell, wouldn't you say? So perhaps, fortunately, they were not moving at full speed, and that may have kept this from being worse than it actually is. The tire bounces to a stop, and Roberto Guerrero and Scotty Brayton out of the race before one lap is complete. There is his crew. Disappointment is obvious, as the wreckers now at the scene of the accident. We'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500-mile race after this commercial and a word from our local stations. ABC Sports exclusive live coverage of the Indianapolis 500 continues. Well, we're back at the Indianapolis 500. Three laps are complete, but they're being run under yellow as a result of an accident that destroyed this car and damaged two others. This is Roberto Guerrero's car, and right now his wife Katie is with Jack Aru. Well, Paul, you heard early in our pre-race show that Roberto and Katie Guerrero had tra traveled a long way to get to Indianapolis, but it's turned out to be a short afternoon with that accident. And I'm with Vince Granatelli right now as we look at uh, Katie Guerrero and uh, Vince, you've talked to Roberto on the radio, uh, his condition, and also what happened. Well, all he said was that uh, uh, Brayton spun in front of him. I'd have uh, nothing to uh, substantiate anything right now. Uh, happened in turn two. We're here in the front straightaway. We can't see anything. I, I guess the main thing is at this point that he's okay, and uh, um, it's obviously very disappointing for everybody here. And it's awfully emotional. I mean, not only for Katie as she continues to be consoled below us, but but also for the entire team. It was written all across your faces that this month of May in less than a lap has totally gone up in smoke. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, obviously, it's not a happy moment for us right now. Uh, we were at some really high hopes here, and uh, uh, at this point, uh, we're going to have to wait till next year. I guess that's the worst part. Katie, I, I, I know it's, it's a difficult time right now, but uh, he's okay. Yeah, that's the best. That's the, the main thing. That's the important thing. And We'll just have to give it a go again next year. It'll be a long year in waiting, but um, we'll get him next year. First time that you've ever experienced this at Indianapolis. He's always finished. Uh, can you describe the emotions right now? It's just devastating, especially so early on. You know, it, it, it's just the last thing that you run through your mind, the, the worst scenario going out like that. But um, we've had four good years before, and we'll have many good years ahead of us, I'm sure. If there's a family, gentlemen, that believes in positive thinking, it's Roberto and Katie Guerrero, and they're going to have to believe awfully hard today. Back to you. What a terrible disappointment, though. Twice he finished second, a third and a fourth. This is the first time he did not finish. Scott Brayton's car is on the hook there as well. And we mentioned a third car. It's the number 16 car of Tony Bettenhouse and also involved in this accident on the start. Now we're looking from Michael Andretti's car. You see Scott Brayton simply lost it, crossing, crossing the line, took Guerrero and Bettenhausen to the wall with him on the second turn of the first lap of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. 
Well, let's take a look now, Sam Posey, at this accident. Paul, I have, I think, a different interpretation of the accident because it looks to me as if Tony Bettenhausen, if we play this just a little bit more, I believe he is right here starting to lose it. In other words, he did not have, he was not part of the, um, of the, uh, the accident which involved, you see there, the circle uh, that I put around the uh, uh, car of Bettenhausen. Uh, in other words, he was not involved uh, with the main accident per se. Whether he saw that ahead of him and that sparked a reaction, I don't know. But it's interesting that he, like Brayton, was driving over those painted lines at the time that he lost control. He's a real veteran of this race, uh, though I think having his eighth or ninth start, uh, Tony Bettenhausen, so it's, it's a surprising thing that it happened. Well, Bobby Unser, we've seen it, not one, but two separate accidents. The first with Brayton and Guerrero and then Tony Bentonhausen. Your analysis. Well, the most likely scenario is there's been some fluids dropped on the pavement, on the racetrack. You can see the other cars, uh, aside from the wreck, you can see the other cars going to the inside of the white line completely, so they're trying to get away from the fluids. All right, so three cars out of the race, the first three positions already determined. At the Indianapolis 500, we continue under yellow with four laps complete. We'll be back. Lap number five, and the green flag comes out once again. The yellow waves at the middle of the first lap, but now we are back racing as Rick Mears challenges his teammate Danny Sullivan going into the first turn. But Sullivan shoots ahead, coming off of turn one. It is now Sullivan chased by Mears, and then a nice fight developing between the Unser family for third position. Look at Sullivan pull away. Well, everybody always wondered, did Pinsky have a game plan? If he has a game plan, it's just the opposite of what everybody thought. Danny Sullivan is racing Rick Mears just as hard as he can, Paul. I'm not so sure what part of the game plan Bob the answer be for Sullivan to be the rabbit and try to pull the field away. Well, I, I really think what happens is, is they just have zero game plan, and those guys are racing their own race. That's generally the way Roger does it. Danny Sullivan accelerates now. Rick Mears is in pursuit. Down the main stretch at the Indianapolis 500, and you ride in the lead at the Indy 500 on board with Danny Sullivan as he comes through the first turn. What did Sullivan just do? He did he pull one of his tear offs off his visor to get better vision? Did he wave suddenly to the crowd with a clenched fist like, I'm leading the race? He's given the signal to the pit, Sam, that he understood what they just said. He's just saying, hey, I heard you with his hint. Does okay. that mean that the radio traps are not working right? Ah, that could be. Radio's not very reliable here as well as we all know. <laughs> here is the battle for third place. The defending champion, Al Unser, his son, Unser Jr., right behind. Well. Al and his dad are really going at it. They have a race just like they were going for the lead. But I think that they're both kind of showing us that they've got 500 miles almost to go yet. Well, we talked about teams and whether or not teams would get together, but what about families? Have these two talked? No, they definitely don't get together. There is no game plan before with them at all or between them. They actually run their own race. And in fact, at times, as we watch their race, and we wonder if they don't run a little bit harder. You're watching the fight for third place. Danny Sullivan leads it, chased by Rick Mears. This is Al Unser, the family Unser. Senior and junior as they fight for third. Now, if you're wondering why Junior doesn't pull up a little bit closer uh, to his dad, one of the reasons is the turbulence that these cars give off makes it very hard to run close up behind another driver. And it isn't until you are determined to make the pass that you close in and really start to struggle in that turbulence. Also, Sam, to add to that, if the car stays up close to the other one, say, for example, three, five laps, the engine starts running hot on the car behind because the air is no longer smooth coming back into the radiator. And it's a hot day. I mean, so obviously that, that is a factor. Uh, however, it would seem as if the leaders, at least, are well spaced out, Paul. Right now, uh, nothing volatile here. Everyone content with where they are in the early going. Well, of course, after the yellow flag, they come back to the green flag single file. That gives them an opportunity to string out just a bit, and it gives a definite advantage to the leader, Danny Sullivan. He battled with Rick Mears for just a moment. Now Rick seems to have dropped back. He's about a second and a half behind the leader, Danny Sullivan. Then comes Al Unzer as we take a look at a lap here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The guess was they would run at over 205 miles an hour. Let's see if that actually is true as Danny Sullivan already is on the back stretch of this two and a half mile oval, 50 feet wide at this point. Sullivan, of course, is celebrating the fact that he has an open track ahead of him. And you see this fabulous view of it and also of the crowd because he knows that within three to four laps, we may even see other
other cars on that main straight looking ahead of him that he's going to start lapping the slower cars. And then this glorious run leading the Indy 500 out all by himself will be over and he'll be into traffic. 42.7 seconds. 210 Sullivan. 210 mile an hour left. That is a little bit faster than we figured this early in the race. Well, Billy Nimmy keeps time in the pit for Danny Sullivan. As we take a look at Danny Sullivan on the back stretch. The speeds that we're looking at, uh, top speed probably about 220. That's a little bit off what they qualified uh, at 228 to 230 top speed because they reset the wings and the chassis uh, for more downforce in the race. So Danny Sullivan begins to overhaul the back of the field and Ludwig Heimrath Jr. just ahead. The question to Danny Sullivan is, are you more serious as a racer now than when you began to drive the Indianapolis cars? Well, I don't know if I'd say I'm more serious. I think it's probably just changed. Um, obviously, at that stage, when, you, when you're hungry and you're trying to get to that uh, level where you're trying to gain everybody's respect and win some races and get established, and after you've won some races and you won Indianapolis, your hunger is a different time. You, you realize what that success means, what it's all about, how great it feels, and you want more of it. But uh, I don't know if I'd say that I'm really trying to establish or become more serious at that level. Well, as you can see, Danny Sullivan now has his hands full because already in just 13 laps, he has come up on the back of the 500 field and begins to work his way through traffic now. Well, he certainly has. The race, for one thing, is a little bit faster than we expected, Paul. And there's been a little bit of mixed up with Mario not being as aggressive at the start as we thought it might be. Let's go to the pits now, Jackaroo. Paul, a couple of laps ago, you were speculating as to whether there was a problem with Danny Sullivan's radios. We've checked with Derek Walker behind me. He says no. The reason for that clenched fist, it seemed, from inside of Sullivan's car, Indianapolis 500 emotion. Back to you. Well, the emotion of the Indianapolis 500 gets everybody in, apparently including the one very cool Danny Sullivan. You know, I really, I thought that was it. I, I just, I know Danny pretty well, and I think He's saying, I'm leading this thing again. And incidentally, it's a guy to whom winning this race would mean a great deal. Danny is not a guy that's going to be around this sport forever. You see him here from our camera inside the cockpit. Look at his eyes as he checks the rearview mirror, then looks back out on the road ahead of him, which is coming at him at over 200 miles an hour. But he is going to retire, and it's not going to be all that far away. And I think a second Indianapolis uh, victory would uh, send him maybe on his way. And I asked him, you know, about retirement. He said, well, one plan I've got. I'm going to take all my trophies to a sculptor in Paris called Cesare and have them compacted into one rectilinear form. <laughs> so he's already thinking ahead at this point. So Danny Sullivan moving up through the field now. Because he's engaging slower traffic, his lap speed is dropping down. His last lap came at about 190 miles an hour, so it's fallen off considerably. Danny Sullivan still poking his nose in between other cars and then jumps forward and comes out and around. Well, the, one of the main reasons he's slowing down right now is that he's into the traffic. He's lapping cars, which we don't expect him to do. The front cars go so fast early on. The rear cars have traffic all the time. Danny's been cleaned right to them. And of course, when he threads his way through those slower cars, many of whom he doesn't know, he has to be very, very careful. Danny Sullivan leads the Indianapolis 500, followed by Rick Mears, and then Al Unser and his son, then Mario Andretti and Ari Lyonsdijk. As we watch Danny Sullivan work his way around the two and a half miles of Indianapolis, Danny Sullivan has a 2.8 second lead over the second place car of Rick Mears. We'll be back with more right after this. We're back at the Indianapolis 500. The fight is for second place. Rick Mears, the first yellow car, then Al Unser, and then his son, as little Al tries to get that as they come onto the main stretch now. Slower traffic just ahead, and three drivers who are brilliant at holding on to that traffic just ahead. Little Al drops back just a bit. Big Al closes in on Rick Mears. A tremendous fight for second. Boy, that is a fight. And here's Mario coming up behind. We're having a better race early in the race than I've seen in a long time, Paul. So we're watching second, third, fourth, and 
fifth. Mario Andretti just off the edge. That white car off the edge of your screen as the front of the field begins to close down in second place. And here comes Al trying to come past Rick Mears. And little Al tries it as well. He's forced down on the inside. Rick Mears holds on to the high side. Look at that fight. Al Unger has second place now. Little Al has third. Rick Mears drops back to fourth, followed by Mario Andretti. You can watch little Al. He's to the left trying to get some clean air. All he thinks he needs is a little bit of traction. He's going to go right by his father. Now, I have to think if there's something wrong with Rick Mears, the problem, you look at Mario go by him. Probably going to make an adjustment to his car when he comes to the pit. Paul. So Mario Andretti comes past Rick Mears as well, and now Ari Leyendijk is lined up behind Rick Mears. So a new second place, while Danny Sullivan is now a full six seconds out in front of the second place car. All right, so I think you have to say what is wrong with Rick Mears. Is it something mechanical, and we're going to see the end of him soon? Or is it something in the handling? They just didn't guess right for today. And I think if it's that, and you see Roger Penske, he is in communication with, uh, with Rick. Then, when the first pit stops come up and they're not far away, then we'll see the first of the changes to Rick Mears' car. And if there's anybody out here today that's good at knowing what's wrong and what to do about it, it's Rick Mears. All right, what could possibly be wrong with Rick's car? Let's go to the Penske pits and Jack. Well, there's a lot of activity here in the Roger Penske-led pit for Rick Mears. What they are going to do is they are going to adjust the handling on the car, and they may very well bring him in in the next five laps. There are what is called a wicker bill that goes on the wings. Well, they'll make some adjustments to that, possibly replace one to try and get better handling. Things are going to get hectic here in just a moment as you change four tires at 40 gallons of fuel and try to do it in 18 seconds, as well as readjust the handling on the car. Let's go back to you. We watch Mario Andretti as he chases down Rick Mears. Now, the wicker bill, Bobby. You actually helped develop it. Let's explain it. Yeah, that's a little tab. It goes on the back of the wings, either the rear or the front wing. And what it does is it generates about a third more energy by having them on, but it does hurt straightaway speed. So what they do is a trade-off. Sometimes they make them as small as they go to have a little bit more straightaway speed. So Rick Mears for a moment there bobbled a car coming through the first turn. Mario caught up behind traffic now as he continues his pursuit. And you know, all month it was Penske this, Penske that. People thinking that the Penske team would just pull out all three cars almost abreast of each other and pull away from the field. My point has always been, this is the Indy 500, where the unexpected has to be counted on. And as you can see now, the Penske team is already in bad trouble with their lead driver, Rick Mears. Carry it further, the Indianapolis 500, where the unexpected is commonplace. Now, let's go down to the pits. Brian Hammonds is back at the hospital. Brian? Paul, the news is good back here at the infield hospital. All three drivers, Scott Brayton, Tony Bettenhausen, and Roberto Guerrero, all have been checked out here at the hospital. All three are okay and will be released from the infield hospital here shortly. Paul, back to you. Well, there couldn't be better news. There you see it, the Hanna Emergency Medical Center. Dr. Henry Bach and his staff keeping track of these drivers. It is mandatory that whenever there is an accident, they go to the hospital despite how good they say they feel. A footnote. And we watch Mario Andretti as he makes the challenge now, but Rick slaps the door shut. A footnote, of course, to Guerrero's crash is that it happened within about 150 feet of that crash last September, which put him uh, in the hospital unconscious for 17 days. So there's a part of this racetrack uh, that Roberto Guerrero is not having much luck with. So Mario Andretti now begins to move in a battle for sixth place. He comes around Rick Mears and picks up the sixth position. Fights all at the front of the field right now as Mario Andretti begins to make his move. You're on board now. Looking over Mario Andretti's right-hand shoulder through the second turn. Slower traffic just ahead. He should be able to handle that rather quickly. And right behind, Rick Mears continues to try and keep up. So at the Indianapolis 500, it is Danny Sullivan that leads. And Mario Andretti has begun his move. But Danny leads by 11 seconds. We'll be back. 27 laps are complete at the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Danny Sullivan leads it by 15 seconds over the second-place car. Currently, Mario Andretti. As Danny Sullivan streaks down the main stretch in the pits, Rick Mears heads for the Penske team and some Penske service. Now, will they be going for a change in the aerodynamics on the car? There's Rick Mears. The crew goes to work, led by Peter Parrott. No movement at the back of the car yet that I see, Bobby Unser. Maybe they're not going to... It's gonna the, front the front wing. 
what they're doing, Paul, is uh, changing the stagger on the rear tire. That will have a lot to do with the way it handles. And they made an adjustment to the front wing. So an adjustment to change the aerodynamics on Rick's car. Now, this car, number six, Mario Andretti, they have displayed the black flag to him, and you can see the reason. He's spewing some vapor at the back of the that's car. Me, that's oil, Paul. Anytime it comes out blue, that's definitely oil. We just can't tell right now whether it's a transmission or the engine. Bobby, Posey, what a devastating blow. Oh, absolutely. But I just want to quickly make the point that Mario Andretti is running a Chevrolet engine, as are all the leaders in this race right now. Chevrolet engines have only once completed a 500-mile race. That one, a less demanding race on the engine than this one. So there's a big question mark. All the Penske cars run Chevrolets. Mario, Little Al, and if it's, if it's a problem that might strike the rest of them, this race could be turned upside down in a hurry. Okay, Sam, but just one quick note on that. The smoke is coming out awfully low. That's normally where the transmission, so it may be the transmission instead of the engine. Usually it comes out of the turbocharger, the engine, but not always. Let's see. Well, Mario Andretti stays out, the smoke gets worse. Al Lenzer Jr. But look at this, as he comes along little Al, he accelerates strongly. So either Mario is not aware. Here comes Danny Sullivan, the leader of the race, as he rolls into the pits. Second place. It's we'll not take over the lead, and that's Mario. Let's go to Jack. Well, Danny Sullivan comes to service with the Penske team, and they go to work adding 42 gallons of methanol fuel. Sullivan looks over to Derek Walker, his crew chief, for any hand signals as to how the work is going. They've checked everything over, and it's a very quick stop. He's off and away. Back up to you. So Danny Sullivan rolls out, but the question is, will Rick Mears beat him into the lead because second place Mario Andretti came in? The officials checking that car now. They've apparently decided it's okay, whatever the problem was, it's all right, they can go with it. So Mario Andretti rolls out of the pits, but remember, his time at Indianapolis has been one of incredible bad luck for 19 years. Sam Posey reports. This is a tale of frustration and dashed hopes that begins, strangely enough, with victory in the world's biggest race. It was 1969, and 29-year-old Mario Andretti, in only his sixth Indy 500, won in a way that suggested he would be making a visit to Winner's Circle again and again. But he never has. Listen to some of the reasons he's broken down. Burn piston. Crash, out of fuel, crash, broken header, lost wheel, accident. And these weren't the failures of a backmarker out of contention. Mario has always run at the front with a good shot to win. Against this litany of failure, however, came stunning success in many other forms of racing, including the World Driving Championship in 1978. But at Indy, well, this was typical. The start of the 1982 race. Kevin Kogan spinning. Mario plowing into it. A race Mario could have won? His teammate Gordon Johncock did. And Mario had been faster than Gordy all month. Or this. Mario leading. Sullivan attempting to pass. Spins. But instead of wrecking his car, he recovers to win. Sometimes Indy has dealt Mario more than just defeat. It has threatened his life. Stunned, he was able to walk away. It is in the Andretti character to find strength in adversity, to look at each setback as improving his odds for the next race. And fate certainly is kind to him elsewhere. Here he wins his third race at Long Beach. Just that at Indy, well, this was last year when he was a lap ahead of the pack. Victory in sight, 23 laps to go, and the engine quit. Will he ever win again? He's 48. His time may be running out, but his determination never will. Mario Andretti back on the track. Al Unzer, who was the leader for the moment, and a car with a problem on the pits as the yellow flag comes out. Looks the yellow like flag Sneva. comes out. Looks like Tom Sneva. 
Tom Sneva, the uh, yeah. former Indianapolis champion. And what a terrible situation this is. Sneva started 14th. He moved up to first place, was coming for the pits, and smacked into the wall. Tom Sneva climbs out of his car and walks away. He's actually in the pit lane, Paul. He certainly is. Bobby Unser. Well, that's uh, most likely, you know, it's very rough coming into the pits here, and he most likely came in just a little bit fast, and we haven't seen the replay yet, but the cars have a tendency. We've seen Foyt spin coming into the pits, so it isn't that it's hard to do. You know, part of the problem is that the pit road is very rough, and also they're so accustomed to running fast. Now watch. Perhaps we can see here what happened to Tom Sneva. He actually oh. lost it coming off of the fourth turn, tapped the outside oh. wall, and spun down into the pit area. Look how lucky he was not to hit the end of the pit, uh, the, uh, pit wall on the right there. He was he, very lucky yeah. on that, Sam. He almost hit that, but he clipped the outside wall, came in, hit the inside wall, almost hit the pit wall there. So. That's Mario and Freddie in the pits. They continue to work on his machine, so obviously that situation a little more serious than originally reported, but we can get an update from Brian Hammond. Paul Bobby Unzer had it right on. It is the problem in the gearbox. Mario is sitting idly in the car, the crew trying to get this problem solved, but meanwhile the engine is dead. Mario is just waiting helplessly in his pit, so it's a serious problem. Paul? And now they are saying you cannot come into the pits. Bob, most of the cars have made their stop, so it's not a problem. Okay, but that's the day in the driver's meetings. All the drivers fear, Paul, is they're going to shut the pits down. There may be a car that really needs to come in there, but right now it's against the rules. No matter how bad you need to come in, you can't do it. First time that we have seen that as the field now under yellow goes around the field. Now, this is not the only situation that has affected the pits. A few moments ago, Teo Fabi. Fabi in the Porsche engine car, of course. Oh, look at that. A wheel. <laughs> Ooh. Dangerous situation here. That wheel carries a great deal of inertia. Fortunately, it stopped right there. But what I don't understand is the new rules require that all these wheels are locked on the cars. Now, that was coming right off the, off the pit stop itself. Perhaps the lock just didn't engage. Well, we haven't seen that yet. Most likely, it wasn't just that the wheel nut was left loose. It's probably going to be that something broke right on the outside part, and the whole hub came off. So the Porsche-powered machine of Teo Fabi, it is a march. They push it back to the pits, and perhaps they can get it back into the competition. We are under yellow once again at the Indianapolis 500. We're back under the yellow flag at the Indianapolis 500. 37 laps are complete. Danny Sullivan, through a series of pit stops, is once again our leader. And Ari Leyendijk being reported now in second place. We mentioned he was moving up through the field. Great deal of confusion out there for the teams as the several incidents have slowed this race down, brought the average speed down to 144 miles an hour and under the yellow flag at the moment. That is a result of Tom Sneva's incident coming off of the fourth turn and hitting the outside wall than the inside pit wall. Here's the order at the moment. Danny Sullivan leads under the yellow, followed by Lion Dyke, and then the Unser family, junior and senior. Jim Crawford, that Buick-powered machine, moving up into the top of the order. At the Indianapolis 500, under beautiful blue skies today. Temperature expected to go to 85 degrees tomorrow night. It's the season premiere of ABC's Monday Night Baseball. Four of baseball's top teams square off in the Los Angeles Dodgers battle. The first place New York Mets or the New York Yankees take on the front-running Oakland A's. Check your local listing for the game in your area. Action begins live at 8 Eastern tomorrow night and only on ABC Sports. So as we take a look at the first 37 laps of the Indianapolis 500, leadership has changed twice here, though Tom Sneva came very close about 500 yards away from being scored as the third leader and then hit the wall. Three lead changes as that battle of seesaw in the front. And so far we've had two yellows. We're still under yellow, completing our 10th lap of yellow flag. Average speed way down right now, owing to those yellow flags. Out of the race, that first lap accident, Guerrero, Brayton, Bentonhausen, Stan Fox is out of the race, and of course you saw the accident of Tom Sneaver. 
No cause given for Stan Fox's retirement at the 500. Interesting point. You see four out of the five guys that are out of the race are out because of crashes, and yet no one has been hurt. Good point about the strength of the car. Let's go to the pits, Jack. Paul, you're looking at a transmission very similar to the one that put out Mario Andretti out of this race. Well, this transmission has put out the gentleman that we were traveling with all month, Derek Daly. Derek, a tough way to end a month, is it not? Mechanical problems? It's such a shame because our plan was perfect. Emerson was actually holding me up for a while, but I was content to sit there because I was still as quick as Mario and uh, Lion Dyke. And then out of the blue, uh, we had a transmission break, and it's just... That's life in the fast lane. You talk about the scope of the Indianapolis 500. We understand you had a family reunion back in Dublin watching this show live today. I had 18 people in the front room at my home, and I'm fine. Next day is on, the next good day is on the way. Let's talk about track conditions very quickly. They seem to be unbelievably bad. They are more slippery now than we've had all month here. Obviously, not just because of the heat, because of the humidity. Um, several times I was, I was on the brakes just to balance the car because the understeer was so bad going in, but... It's the same for everybody. Everybody's going to have to cope. And yet it doesn't seem as if it's affecting Danny Sullivan as badly as some of the others. Um, I think it, Danny's running in clean air. And when Sneva ran behind me by himself, he was very fast. When he got up behind me, he wasn't n anywhere near as fast because of the dirty air. So Danny's got an advantage running at the front. Well, Paul, it looks like we're going to get back to some action. Let's go back up to you. And let's ride with Danny Sullivan as you look over his right-hand shoulder, coming to the fourth and final turn, leading onto that log straight away. Again, the green flag from Dwayne Sweeney. And again, we are racing at the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Rick Mears, right behind him, is being scored at the moment as one lap behind the leader. So Danny Sullivan, well out in front, Bobby Unser. Well, they're having a really a go at it. Rick, if he is, in fact, a lap behind, which he apparently is, Paul, is trying to get by Danny so he can make up that lap. And then on another yellow, he could. And there's our second place, Harry Leindyke. Now, he's really been going good today. Nobody's seen him much, but he's really been hauling. Harry Leindyke from the Netherlands never won a race in the Indy cars, never at Indianapolis, but this could be his day. He certainly is due. The reason Rick Mears is a lap back, he made a second pit stop, presumably to try to correct the handling. And it's interesting now with, well, only one of the Penske cars out front, that the strategy of sheer numbers, which is the Penske organization philosophy, the idea of basing their approach on scale, uh, is paying off at this point because uh, they need all the cars that they have got. And it's interesting. A lot of people say, well, Roger can do this because he has uh, so much money and he has such a big organization. But he had, it's really the other way around. He spends this much and he, he approaches it in this way because he knows that the nature of racing at Indianapolis is exactly like what we've been seeing, which is unexpected things. You need a lot of guys out there. So Ari Leyendijk running in second place right now. And look at how good that machine handles as he battles with Bobby Rahal. Yes, and Bobby Rahal. Normally we look at Bobby Rahal as leading these races, but now you see Ari Leyendijk just really working on him hard. And there he goes by. Rahal has not been quite as good so far this year. You're on board with Bobby Rahal looking ahead. His strap is what you see flapping around at the edge of that cockpit. That's yep. the bottom of the helmet, the uh, little strap that goes up and holds his helmet. It's a, not a factor. It's a very light piece of material, Paul. Yeah, the point is his helmet is held on. Uh, this is a danger uh, for him. Well, here is a fight for third place right now. The family Unser continues their battle. Al Unser Jr. and his dad. It is Al Unser that is in front at the moment. Battle Everybody, for third place. Everybody's finding it difficult to get by Bobby Rahal, so it must be a little bit. There's the, there's a shot of Little Al and Big Al in the back of Rahal. That's a beautiful shot, Paul. As Little Al and Big Al continue to battle, and just in front of them, two slower cars that they will have to engage in just a moment. What a great shot from Bobby Rahal's cars. Little Al now breaks off from his dad and breaks off the fight. The track has been slippery. If you'll notice, a lot of the cars are running completely down to the grass as you see little Al did there. And what happens is we've already lost two transmissions and Lord only knows how much other oil. So at the moment, the racetrack is generally slippery. And there goes Al around Bobby Rahal. In a few moments, we'll be talking about Bobby Rahal's engine because it could be a factor toward the end of the race. It's a Judd engine, and they say that 
He'll go farther with the same load of fuel. Look at Al come to the inside. Ari Leyendike, Al Unser Jr. all fighting, and Big Al gets around his son as they head toward the first, first turn in an absolute traffic jam. Boy, that was a good pass. He had a real good tow. He whipped the car completely to his left. He had a good enough tow where he had to go for all of them right there, Tom. I have been watching races in Indianapolis since 1963 when I first came here as a kid and sat in the stands just behind where we are right now. I've never seen action as good as this on the racetrack. Boy, I'll agree with that, and I go back a few years further than that, Sam. And you look it, too. At the Indianapolis 500-mile race, it is still Danny Sullivan that leads it. Ari Leyendike with a magnificent run of the day, and Mario Andretti, we keep following him. His car is still in the pits but you ride now with the leader at the 500. Well, an interesting... So Danny Sullivan out in front, and he leads by a full 23 seconds, and then that wonderful battle between second, third, and fourth. We'll be back. We're back at the Indianapolis 500-mile race. The 72nd running 48 laps have completed. We're past the first 100 miles now. Danny Sullivan continues his dominance of this race. Ari Leyendijk with a remarkable drive at 26, almost 27 seconds back. Al Unser Jr. and Sr. continue their battle, and Emerson Fittipaldi has moved up through the field. Well, as we look at the car of Danny Sullivan, the whole issue of superstitions at Indianapolis comes up. Penske has never entered a car with green on it, dislikes green, and through the years has forbidden his friends and relatives wearing green even to enter the pits. But the sponsor of this car wanted a little green and some green pinstriping on that car so it would look more like the product. And Roger, who likes a certain color of green more than anything else, that is the color of money, decided to go with it. So the car with the unlucky Penske green is currently leading the race. And turning laps at 200 miles an hour. And speaking of green and luck, the Porsche is a green trimmed car and it has now been pushed back into gasoline alley and retired from the race let's go to brian hammond well as mario andretti sits idly in his cockpit as the crew continues to work on the gearbox car owner paul newman is with me and mario's luck continues bad here in indianapolis it seems sorry i couldn't hear you seems like mario's luck is continuing bad in indianapolis uh, we thought we could outrun it this year and things were looking very promising and seal on the gearbox with. You know how frustrating it is for Mario. It's got to be equally as frustrating for you. Well, it's worse for him. Mario Andretti, every lap the leaders take is one lap farther behind he is falling. Paul? Paul Newman, one of the owners of Mario Andretti's car as he watches on, a very skillful race driver in his own right. But Sam Posey, Mario is staying in the car. He wants back into the fight. He will not give up until it's uh, absolutely all over. That's the Andretti way, and I don't blame him. Well, they're averaging about 149 miles an hour, four miles an hour behind the average last year, and well back from the 192 mile an hour average set back in 1984 by Mario Andretti. Well, as we watch Danny Sullivan, there's Danny right there with the in-car cam. As we watch him from the higher shots go around the track, it's interesting to note that he's really sticking. I mean, his car is really getting a hold of the track. You can see all the rubber and the oil laid down as we get into the turns right there. Danny is not having to run to the left of the line. Danny is really sticking, and he's done that from lap one. Now, yeah, Bobby, you were talking earlier that the track is a little slick. He's averaged on that last lap 193 miles an hour. Now, we all know that he's capable of running almost 20 miles an hour faster than that on a lap. Does that speak to the condition of the track surface? It does to some degree. Some of it is traffic that he's passing. The rest of it is just plain and slippery. You can honest to goodness, if you look at your screen good, you can see how slippery it is in the turns right now. Well, the fastest car on the past several laps has been the seventh car of Ari Leyendijk. He's been running at 198 miles an hour, but here's the battle for third place. It continues to be a family affair between Al Unser, that's the bright yellow car, and his son, the little Al. Well, they've been at it since the start also, Paul. They've really been having a battle. They've been seesawing back and forth, and if anybody thinks the big Al's too old, they better take a look at him today. And, Bobby, that's got to be fun for the two of them. Oh, it really is, because there is no game plan like we talked about earlier. They're honest to goodness racing each other very hard. So Al Unser 
runs in third place and currently leads his son running in fourth. What I admire about what Big Al is able to do at this point is the hardest thing if you haven't been racing in the other races this year, Phoenix and Long Beach, is to have a good feel for how your car is going to handle in turbulence. Last year, you remember, he came to the team uh, right at the last minute and dropped way back in the early laps. In fact, as we see Lyondike peel off of the pits, Al Unser had been lapped by this point in the race last year. And Mario Andretti rolls back into the action as Ari Lyondike comes into the pits. Lion Dyke, of course, the Dutchman, 34 years old. An interesting thing about Ari, for everybody else, the Indy 500 is such a big deal for the Americans who follow this, as I think the three of us have for our whole life. But in Holland, well, it wasn't that much of a big deal. On the track itself, the battle continues. Now it is for second place as little Al tries inside of his father once again, goes way below the line and has to be very careful as he comes back up above it onto the backstretch. The fight is for second. Lion Dyke is in the pits. He was second. Boy, that's a tough race right there, Paul. Little Al's running clear down the grass trying to pass Daddy. And ironically, his dad is just uh, leaving him no room to get by. All right, but there are two kinds of trust operating between these two men out there right now. One is the trust that exists between two great racing drivers. We see Lion Dyke coming back out of the pit. The other kind of trust, and this is the best racing we've seen, little Al, is the trust between father and son. You almost couldn't have a more ideal situation for a battle. I guess Uncle Bobby would have to say that was a little too close. <laughs> well, I I'll tell so you, too. <laughs> they came as close to the inside wall on this track as I've ever seen them run. Bobby, just as a friend of the family, I think that was a little too tough. So little Al, Al Unser Jr., moves into second place behind the leader, Danny Sullivan, and this fight has carried second place a bit forward. Danny Sullivan now only has a 15-second advantage over Al Unser Jr. Third place is now Al Unser Sr. But 15 seconds is a cushion, though, uh, that is almost a third of the track. So if, if you picture it, and by the way, the lead drivers always carry in their mind a good picture uh, of where the opposition is around the track. And for uh, Danny right now, he knows that the, the battle for second, and he will be being kept up to date. Uh, you see his cockpit there is, is fully a third of the track behind him. So he's really running on his own. On board with Danny Sullivan now, the leader of the Indianapolis 500. He's dominated the early going, and now he's picked the pace up back to 202 miles an hour. We'll be back with more. Page with Sam Posey and Bobby Unzer as Danny Sullivan, the leader under the yellow flag, is making a four-tire change and pit stop. Does it in a tick over 13 seconds. Now, the reason for the yellow flag, just before we rejoin you, caused by A.J. Foyt. We watch him as he ricocheted off the wall coming off of the second turn, slid to a stop, but A.J. Foyt moving in the cockpit through with some frustration his steering wheel off and is apparently okay. We watch Raul Boisel, Michael Andretti come in for routine stops under the yellow. Well, you know, seeing A.J. out like that, uh, Paul, I hope he's all right. It's been 18, it's been 11 years since he has won the race. Uh, and in the last few years, he really hasn't been competitive here. But I don't think it matters that much uh, because he is part of the legend of this place. Basically, the way the bricks are part of the legend of the place. And I talked to somebody uh, last night out in the parking lot. I said, well, who do you like in this race? And he said, I like A.J. Boyd. And I said, why? He isn't really going to be that competitive. He said, well, I named my son after him. And I, I think that sort of says it all. Well, for about a moment, this car, the number one machine of Al Hunter was the leader when Danny Sullivan pulled down into the pits, but now with pit stops being made under the yellow, the order is scrambled. Let's go back and see if we can look at this accident, Bobby. Boyd ricochets off the wall. Hard to tell what got him up there, though, Bob. Yes, I can't tell. Well, that tire, it... the tire seems to have been off in advance of his impact, you think? I don't no, know. No, Paul, he hit the, he hit the fence losing the tire, and, and we saw the replay just a snitch too late to make a, a decision Whoa. on it, but his left front but, tire came out. He's also got the rear wing bent up. But look in the foreground, either Rick Mears or Al Unser narrowly avoiding upper right of the screen there. That was a close call. Started his way right through. 
A.J. Foyt did climb out of the cockpit. Yes, we saw him climbing out, so it doesn't look like he's serious. There's our in-car cam of Bobby Rahal. Been a little bit off today. An interesting thing to note, Paul, for everybody, may change things a little bit, is Rick Mears came in under the green. All of the other cars that are running really fast right now came in under the yellow. So let's go down to the pits. Brian Hammonds is with A.J.'s car owner, Jim Gilmore. And Jim just told me that there may have been a little warning given by A.J. over the radio as to what may have come. Well, A.J. was very concerned about the slippery track. We didn't change the tires last time. Our pit stop, I think, was, uh, it, it was excellent, really. But I'm not at all surprised. The way they're coming in the pits, as you know, uh, they're sliding in the pits, and the track is so hot, it's just almost like ice out there. So regardless if your car can do the speed or not, one little thing can cost this. And all the cars have been going out, I think, really, is, is something that we almost could predict before the day started. You heard from AJ over the radio. Is he okay? I haven't heard a thing other than I think he got out of his car, so that's a sign he's okay. Jim Gilmore the AJ Foyt team. Disappointed. They're out of this race. Well, Bobby Unser, exactly what you suggested. This track is getting very slippery. Now, part of that is due to the heat of the day. We talked about temperatures and how they would affect the cars and the drivers. We didn't talk about the track. 85 degrees it should get warmer through the afternoon that literally boils the asphalt surface of this speedway yes it does Paul and what it really caused from as you lay the rubber down here's Floyd again a replay of Floyd he's coming back across the track so with all the smoke we really can't see what happened but what happens is the rubber gets on the track the heat is there and then you put a little bit of oil on it boy it's like Jim said it's like ice well, what did happen was A.J. Foyt ended his 31st run of the Indianapolis 500 very early. Let's go to the pits, Jack Aroon. We're here in the Roger Penske-led pits. Now, remember, he started three cars on the front row. Let's, let's see if we can get a word with Roger real quick. Roger, they saying that you still have some problems with Rick Mears? Well, the thing, he said he's getting a little bit of oversteer uh, as the... As the fuel load goes down, so we've been trying to adjust the car, and of course, right then uh, we got a yellow. He was going to run with Danny there pretty easily at the beginning of that second run, but it's a long day. We're just trying to get the thing dialed in. We just got to keep running. Got to look at Danny Sullivan though, and that's got to make you feel good. Well, that feel makes me feel great, but we got to get all three cars up there because anything can happen at the end of this race. There's a guy that knows what he's talking about. And let me remind you about one thing, gentlemen, when you talk about fuel consumption in these cars. Remember that they carry 40 gallons of methanol fuel, which averages about six to seven gallons. So you're talking about 300 pounds difference in a 1,500 pound race car during the course of one stop to the next. Back to you. We look down on the two and a half miles of Indianapolis from the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise from Pompano Beach, Florida. The pilot is Captain Joe Chamberlain from Norwood, Massachusetts, and our cameraman is Bill Sullivan. Well, we'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500, which is currently under yellow after this commercial and a word from our local station. That they are coming back to a green flag, and we don't want to miss the battle for the lead at the Indianapolis 500-mile race. 64 laps now complete. Two leaders, two changes. There are the statistics for this race thus far. Some interesting names out of the 500. A.J. Foyt, Roberto Guerrero, very early in the going. Mario Andretti, still fighting to stay in the 500, but fighting a very unwieldy thoroughbred. Well, and if Roger seemed calm in that interview with Jack a few moments ago, just remember that at this point in the race last year, the car that was going to win the race, Al Unser Sr., was a lap behind. So, Mears is still in real good shape. Pace car rolls into the pit area, and Ludwig Heimreich cracks the wall coming off of the fourth turn. Everybody bottles up behind him. Will everyone miss him? That's the question. Oh, he continues to Sullivan. spin. Danny oh, Sullivan oh. right there and part of it. Ludwig Heimreich Jr., as they come back to the green flag, in trouble off of the fourth turn. What other problems will this accident have caused? Well, it's in that same slippery place. We've had some problems there before. Very slippery, but obviously, Danny got to it. Looks like it's okay. Might have lost some ground, but he at least missed the wreck. Well, if Danny Sullivan's heart wasn't pounding before, I promise it's pounding now. The lead of the 500 almost taken away from him as they were coming back to the green flag. Ludwig Heimrath Jr. out of that car. He's all right. But Bobby, that's the second time we've seen an accident, a very similar accident right there. Here, it, here is Dominic, or is Ludwig Heimrath, but let's look at the accident. He slips coming off of the fourth turn. Well, I think it's just plain slippery up there, and he lost the car. We see no other car involved or any other reason for it, so I'm pretty sure that's what happened, Paul. Watch for Danny. If this shot runs on, we'll see him come in from the right-hand side right now. 
down in the foreground. Sullivan just squeaking by. And it looked like he had the brakes locked as hard as they could without slipping because the car was twitching around a little bit. Well, he Look lost at a lot of ground angle. from it, but at least he made it. Just a little bit came in there awfully fast, awfully hard. Didn't hit the car, or excuse me, the wall all that hard, though, because his car's not bent that much. Sullivan had the presence of mind to put his hand and up. here's what he Danny Sullivan that. saw. Yeah, he put his hand up to warn the cars behind him. So Sullivan is driving one terrific race. There it is. His hand up. He says the accident's occurring. He saw the the smoke of the accident what he doesn't know is that car is sliding across the track coming down in front of him Sullivan brings his hand back to the wheel looks to the right to make sure that he has room to make the move that he makes that is the ultimate professional racing driver Danny Sullivan signals those behind him protects them brings his hands back in checks the right and goes around the accident well you know Bob Greasy the a uh, great quarterback is with us here today watching. Uh, of course, he works for our ABC commentary uh, group, and, and that's the sort of play you might expect to see in a football game. A halfback threading his way through the pack. Well, Sam, let's take a look at this as we're under yellow once again from another angle. They work with that car at the head of the pits. Still trying to get Heimren's car off of the track. Now watch here. comes loose right there oh was he touched from behind i, I wonder i if think he, he might have been tapped, tapped from behind bobby what do you think well it certainly looks like he had a little bit of help uh, it's a little <laughs> hard to see the best perception from now here, bobby <laughs> i say he had a little bit of help in this bit that's all it takes of course look at ludwig uh, canadian a young canadian with a big future i think his Very dad good was a driver. driver put his hand right up to try to signal the others Here's Michael Andretti's onboard camera. The same situation. You can see again the smoke of the accident ahead. He was a little closer than Danny Sullivan. Car Remember, they're not up to speed yet, Paul. So they do have, when they slow down, they're not going to slide the cars or spin them. The only guy that's in trouble is Ludwig in this particular case. The rest of us can really jog you about. Yes, but it's still true, isn't it, Bobby, that the cars are set up because they only turn left, basically. They don't handle that well when they're being braked hard. They don't handle very well when they're turning right. So even something that's happening at relatively low speed is still tough for the drivers. Normal speed, the same accident there it once is. again. He was hit hard. I'm sure there's a tap there. No was that, question in my mind. Was that by Lion Dyke? That nearly all black car. Now, Lion Dyke, of course, has been in and out of the uh, headwaters of this race, running second, third, second. And uh, if, if he sustained that hard a hit into Heimrath, uh, we may see some damage to Lion Dyke's car. All right. The crew apparently recognized it, and there they are, working on his machine bent front wings. Now, they've got a yellow flag. They've got time to repair. That's and Lion Dyke says, let's go. Yeah, a little bad decision on his part. He's going to run a little while without the right front wing on the car, which will make it handle very badly, but just to keep his lap count going. So yeah. now that we know a bit more, let's take a look. Lion Dyke was accelerating. He smacked the rear end of Heimrath, who wasn't accelerating quite as fast, put Heimrath into the wall, and Heimrath out of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Now, in just a moment, we'll take that station break that we had promised our local stations as the crowd still on its feet at the Indianapolis 500 with 67 laps complete and an average speed of 147.4 miles an hour. Giant crowd at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with Danny Sullivan despite that apprehensive moment still in the lead. Now we'll take a station break. We're back at the 72nd running of the Indianapolis 500. Paul Page, Jack Aroot, Brian Hammond, Sam Posey, and Bobby Unzer with you. 68 laps complete, 145.9 miles an hour. The average speed, the Goodyear airship, floats lazily over this giant oval at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Let's go down to the pits now, Brian Hammond. Paul, we are with Ludwig Heinrath, Jr., who just spun and hit the wall in turn four. What happened, Ludwig? I really don't have much of an idea. All I know is we were uh, coming onto the front straight, waiting for a restart. It didn't look like we were going to get one because the pace car was still on the track and all the track lights were still yellow. And I got nailed from behind. Uh, the car, we were just starting to make the car work. It was a little bit scary at first. It was real loose. And uh, we were just trying to stay out of trouble for that until we got the car working. And unfortunately, it just didn't work out for us. I 
I'd like to thank Mackenzie, my sponsors, for, for being here and supporting me. I'm sorry it didn't work out better for them, but we'll be back and we'll get it right. So you were tapped from behind? Absolutely. I was just minding my own business, and I got really drilled from behind. So uh, I don't know who it was yet, but when I find out, I think I'll wring his neck. Ludwig Heimrath Jr. now has to make a trip to the hospital, but as you can see, he is okay. Paul? No, let's go down to the pits of Jackaroo. Well, Brian, one family that was a little concerned about maybe possibly having to go to the hospital this weekend was Shelly Unser with her husband, Al Jr. We understand that he had a real tough day yesterday, and you almost thought about maybe checking into an emergency room with uh, food poisoning? Well, they don't know if it was just the flu or food poisoning, but he got real sick before the parade and wasn't able to get in the car, and we brought him back here, and Dr. Bach took care of him, took a look at him, and then by last night he was able to finally get some soup down him and felt real good today, so... As any driver will tell you, what's really important is to keep the fluids full here as you get ready to go 500 miles. Take a look at just how hot it is here trackside. It's almost 110 degrees in the sun. Well, a driver will lose an awful lot of fluid, and Shelly, on that last pit stop, we watched him, and he refused to drink. He's a tough guy, and besides that, Uncle Bobby cheered him up. Uncle Bobby said, I've won three 500 sicker than a dog, so he figured if Uncle Bobby could do it, he could do it. I think that just about says it all from down here, gentlemen. Bobby, anything that you can do, little Al, your nephew, can do better. Well, actually, though, that's a point that sometimes when you are sick, it takes the uh, tension away from the days leading up to the start. You, you in, in your own mind, you say, I can't win this thing. You relax, you go out there, and you do a terrific job just as he's doing. All right, they continue to struggle with Ari Leyendijk's car. If they work on it a few seconds, then they send him out so he doesn't lose his place in the field. Now, they've run out of black wing, so they're putting a red wing on the front of his car, but he's dropped all the way back to a 16th position, and that's a wing off of his teammate and car owner's Dick Simon's car, one of their spare wing. He now has a red wing black wing. On the back stretch. The field, with, led by Danny Sullivan. Let's take a one more look, a different angle yet, of this accident that caused this last yellow. And Heimrath, tapped from behind, spins to the outside, slides across the track. But fortunately, you can see how fast the safety crews rolled. The car is still coming up, but the safety crews were already rolling as soon as the uh, yellow flag popped on. By the way, Jim Garner, who's been a pace car driver here and a good friend of racing, has not been well lately and watches from his home in California. We do wish him well. As we get ready to come back to the green flag, it will be led by Danny Sullivan. There is Dwayne Sweetie. The green flag is out. I'm surprised they place Al Unser Jr. I'm surprised they dropped the green flag. Uh, Danny anticipated that start. He really jumped it by such a big margin, but it shows you how totally pumped up he is in every way. This recalls the race in 1986. I'm sorry, in 85, when he won the race, he had this kind of super aggressive, pumped up thing. And look at how close he's coming to the wall. He is not going to be denied this 500 if he has anything to say about it. His favorite view, a clear course ahead. Well, he's certainly been the best handling car today, Paul. Above all of them, he's really been sticking to the track. And probably the second best car, maybe it's been Little Al at this particular time. In second place right now is little Al, Al Unser Jr., but he is about seven seconds back from the leader of the race. And the man who started 18th in a Buick-powered machine, Jim Crawford, has now moved up into third. Well, that's a lot further than many of would have thought. That's a stock block engine, so the people that don't know, it's the V6 stock block-based engine, and Crawford is doing a magnificent job. Be up to third place, I'm sure, is a lot better than people expected. Looking back through the field now, we catch the interval back to the second place car. You see Mario Andretti, who has that gearbox apparently fixed and is back running. So that stay in the pits was worth it for Mario Andretti in that bright white car number six. It's, it's impossible, Paul, for Mario to gain back the distance and lost in the pits, so everybody will know. But it's good to stay in the race because sometimes if you have a lot of cars dropping out, it'll still mean good for the point set. Also emotionally for a driver, Bobby. Uh, I mean, we know it so well. If you can race, you want to race. You can't just, you can't stand to just stand there by the pit, knowing you could get in the car and be out there. The largest race in the world. Everybody wants to finish. 
So Danny Sullivan, last lap, turned 209 miles an hour. Al Unser Jr. runs in second place, 12 and a half seconds back. Look at that immense lead. Each time Danny has had a clear track, he's been able to pull away with exactly the same kind of superiority that Mario Andretti had last year. Al Unser Jr. has now passed through your screen in car number three. The, the car moving car, slowly Crawford. in the foreground, incidentally, there, I, I believe, was a Johnny Rutherford in another of the Buick engine cars, the car now coming into the pits, Paul. So at the top of the field, Danny Sullivan, Al Unser Jr., there's little Al darting out in second place. Jim Crawford runs in third. In fourth place is Al Unser, the defending 500 champion. You can notice it's running completely under the white line. Track is still slippery. When it gets down there, they get closer to the grass and closer to grass to try to stay out of the oil. And that's what he's doing. Well, little Al spent his first three years as a sprint car racer. And uh, in sprint car racing, you run on the dirt. And you get used to all sorts of different surfaces with people coming through on road, uh, as road racers do not. And I think that little Al is probably more comfortable with these changing and slippery conditions than a majority of the drivers out there. The Gallus car, it's really been fast since Long Beach. So Al Unser Jr., car number three, runs 18 seconds back from the leader. He is in second place at the Indianapolis 500. Is this the day for his first Indianapolis 500-mile race win? Well, Al Unser Jr., car number three. The question to him is, where, in fact, does your racing style come from? Oh, I don't know. I think uh, uh, most of it just came from Dad. You know, being around Dad, being, being raised with Dad, and and, uh, and just being around racing, and, and the fact that I love the sport, I, I, uh, I'll i do anything to, to drive race cars and, and to try to run up front in the, the IndyCar circuit, and so uh, I go hunting for just about anything that I could uh, uh, see or listen to or whatever to pick up any kind of points that uh, that would make the car work better, make it go faster, and, and make myself go faster. So, so little Al, Al Unser Jr., 26 years old, his fifth start here at the Indianapolis 500-mile race. He's certainly looking good. He's really hauling on down the road. There's Shelly, helping keep track of the scoring. She gets very excited, but she's really a dedicated little girl. Really helps little Al a lot. Shelly watches as her husband maneuvers his way around the Indianapolis 500 with all of the early action. The pace seems to have settled for just a moment. You're on board with Bobby Rahal right now. He runs in ninth place, and I'm sure everyone in Columbus, Ohio, his home, wondering why he's back so far. Well, the indication from the pits is that this car has a slipping clutch that they are trying to keep alive and keep Rahal in the Indianapolis 500. 77 laps are complete. Danny Sullivan flashes across the line and completes 78. 22 seconds ahead of second place, Al Hunter Jr. We'll be back. We're back live at the Indianapolis 500 as the yellow flag comes out. Let's go to the pits and check a route. Paul Page, for 31 years, this man has wrestled the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He's won four times, but you lost today, A.J. Foyt. Well, it just started off bad. We had a bad vibration, the word go, and we changed tires and killed the engine. Once to start the engine, the starter blew up in the pits, and... Uh, then we was just pacing ourselves, and I seen a group of cars there, and I was kind of moving up steady, and I went to go under uh, one of the cars, and the air just caught me and jerked me around. It was just one of them things. Well, your next-door neighbor here in Gasoline Alley just spun out on the racetrack, Steve Chassis, so he's not having a very good day either. Well, I think a lot of them's having uh, problems today. Uh, the track seems to be a little greasy from the heat, but uh, that's racing, you know. you got to take the good with the bad, and I just flat screwed up. That's it. How many more years, A.J.? I don't know. After a day like today, it gets pretty disgusting. Well, Danny Sullivan has just completed his work on pit road, and now let's go back up top side to Paul Page. Well, with that yellow flag, the leaders all decided to come into the pits. Danny Sullivan was in, and now Al Unser Jr. also making a routine stop under the yellow flag. And we watch to see if Jim Crawford, who was running in third place, will stay out on the racetrack. And Grim Crawford does scream down the straightaway. We watch Al Unser, who has dropped back at least one position as a result of this stop under the yellow flag. And look at this. Al Unser Jr. rolls down to the end of the pit. His car stalled for a moment. He's trying to get it going. It chugs ahead. Bobby Unser, what could be wrong? 
hard fuel pickup. He's probably close on fuel and it stalled. The only other thing that can happen, Paul, would be likely a vapor lock, meaning it's hot as it is. Remember what we talked about in the yellow flag, sometimes you get too much heat in the engine. Bobby Rahal a little hesitant to pass. You're not supposed to pass on that lane. He wanted to make sure that everybody saw that that car was in trouble. Yes, but seconds before he passed, Rich Vogler leaving the pit. Bobby Rahal did pass in the pits there, leaving. Vogler was running slow. That won't be a rules infraction, Sam, because Earl Allen is having problems getting up to speed. No, no, this was Rich Vogler. Uh, this is the, the moments car. before that. This is the car here of Steve Chassis. And they're bringing over a stretcher. Chassis is still in the car, so apparently there is some injury involved in this accident of the 35 car Steve Chassis. Let's take a look at what happened up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, Bobby Unger. Steve Chassis lost it coming into the corner. No, he didn't lose it. He, I'm sorry, uh, Bobby, didn't mean to butt in. He touched wheels with another car. That's how. That's what triggered that. Well, that was coming back for a restart, and there was another another touch in there, Sam, just like you said, and uh, spun Steve out immediately. A wild guess is that might be why Rich Vogler was leaving the pit slowly uh, moments ago when I mentioned that uh, Bobby Rahal got bottled up behind him. It was an orange car like Vogler's uh, that Chassis touched. Under today's rules, it's just not a rules of fraction to pass leaving the pit. If a car is disabled, then they're passing. Wasn't disabled though, I, I don't think. So we look across the second turn now. The rescue crews, the finest in the world, in fact, are there at the car. They have a truly coordinated effort to handle a situation like this. As Al Unser Jr. comes back into the pits, he was just in a moment ago, so perhaps something wrong here. We'll go away. We'll be back with this story as we continue at the Indianapolis 500. Back at the Indianapolis 500 under the yellow flag, and this is Al Unser Jr. He's beginning to unhook in the cockpit. They're working on that car. Let's go to Jack Aru. And what they're working on is the CV joint. Rick Gallus here has now been called over to, to, to uh, make some changes, but what has happened is the CV joint, as you can see in the picture, that is what is like kind of the, the drive shaft on a rear engine car. That is what provides the drive from the engine to the wheels. Well, that CV joint is what, according to Rick Gallus, has snapped in Al Unser Jr.'s car. Now, let's we can get a word here with Rick right now. Rick, disappointing a CV joint putting Al Jr. out of the race. Yeah, real disappointing. You were really pumped up here. I mean, you guys, the tension was just, you could feel it as you walked by this pitch. You really felt like you could win this one. Well, I did, you know, uh, Sullivan's doing a good job out there. He's real quick, but we're running 204s at the end there, and the guy's doing a good job in the pits, and Al is using his head, but it's just one of those days. When you come close and you fail, what's the feeling? Well, you just got to go work harder and come back, you know, like we did at Long Beach. We had a problem at Phoenix, came back and won Long Beach, and had actually had a chance to win this race, but uh, Sullivan's awful tough, and, and we just have to look forward to Milwaukee now. Well, let me update you, too, on the other Unser teammates, or actually the Gallus people. Al Jr., the little Al who's now walking out of his car, he said to his wife, Shelly, last night, you know who I think is going to win the Indianapolis 500? Mario Andretti. So he thinks that Danny Sullivan will win. His driver thought Andretti, and Andretti's already out, as is Al Jr. Let's go back to you. And there you see a terribly disappointed little Al. I was a little slow down the straightaways to the Penske's, and so Dad... Al Unser Jr., a constant velocity joint is what us old-timers know as the old universal joint, a little more modern. That's right. Allows for the flex and the half shaft coming out of the gearbox and extending out to the rear wheel. But Danny Sullivan still is the dominant force in the Indianapolis 500-mile race, still averaging quite slowly due to a series of yellow lights. 143 and a half miles an hour is the yellow, the yellow is the moment, the average of the race under the yellow flag. And in second place is Jim Crawford, that Buick-powered machine that uh, everybody says has plenty of power. Let's go down to the pits now. Once again, let's go to the garage area. Brian Hammonds. We are with little Al, and what happened to Al? Al Jr. obviously being consulted by his pit crew and obviously is not wanting to talk at this point. Tough day for little Al. He was running strong. A broken CV joint puts an end to Al Unser Jr.'s day. Little out. Yeah. We're not even on the 22 laps. We're not even on the through the race. Tough day, little out. We need the points. It seems like this conversation is that trying to convince him to go back to the race car. It's still in the pits. It's still drivable. Well, it's. 
sometimes the drivers feel it's worth doing, sometimes they don't. Paul, it's, uh, well, like he's turning Mars back. Get right back in. He's heading back toward Gasoline Alley. Perhaps was, he's going that, back to that car. That was Alan Merton, the designer of that team, talking to him. So Alan carries a lot of weight. Well, Brian Hammonds is right there. Perhaps he'll find out in just a moment. But the car is still in the pits. Let's go back to Brian Hammonds. Brian, are you there? He's walking his way back toward his car. You're going to go back in the car. Yeah, we're going to get back in it, you know. And they're saying they can fix it, and they said everybody's dropping out like flies, so we'll get back in it and see what happens. You don't, you don't look like you agree with that strategy. Well, I want to win the race, and the, you know, but uh, we'll get back in it and run for third, I guess. What does this do to your emotions? You thought you were out of the race, and now you're getting back in the car. Nothing. We, we are out of the race, and so, but uh, we'll get back in it for some points. But, you know, that's the way we do it, so we'll do it. Little Al's a gamer. Now let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Brian, let's update you as to why a team would decide to do that. Now, Rick Gallus, he checked out how many cars have already dropped out of this event. You know there's points, and there's a national championship up for grabs beyond winning the Indianapolis 500. They're running very well in that points chase. So he said, if we can fix it, not lose too, too many laps, we could still finish in the top 10 here, and that would be as strong as a top 10 finish with only one lap down in most 200-mile events. So as Shelly Unser and, comes behind uh, me, as they're getting ready to strap to Little Al back in the car, the and now instead of the Indy 500 checkered flag, position. they may be looking for national now championship well, points. Back to you. As well, Jack the Root is, as the, the entire bed. field circles at 80 miles an hour behind the pace car, and they work on Little Al's car, he is dropping with each lap further and further down through the field. He is now down to 15th position as cars have been passing him. And Bobby, you had a note. Something being done with Allender's car, the senior. We, we have a note that he's changing the nose on uh, my brother's car, Paul, and I don't exactly know why at the moment, but that could be problems for Al also. So under yellow, we anticipate a green flag momentarily. 88 laps are complete, and Danny Sullivan is still the force. Coming up next, it's live final round coverage of the Memorial Golf Tournament presented by Dean Witter. Ale Irwin was the leader coming into today. Top golfers competing for over a million dollars in prize money on the course that Jack Nicklaus built. It's coming up next right here on ABC. Indianapolis 500 mile race. We take a look after 88 laps. Two leaders still all we have had in the race. Danny Sullivan being predominant among those two. Three lead changes and cautions. No, far too many by my book. Four for 33 laps already. As we come back to the green flag, the pace car off. Again, the green flag from Dwayne Sweeney. And we are racing. It will be the number nine car of Danny Sullivan, who is third back in that serial that we keep our focus upon. And Jim Crawford in second place. And Al Unser in third place right now. Rick Mears moves up in fifth place but he is a lap off of the leader well he is Paul but if you watch Danny he's still sticking as good as he did look to the racetrack as he did the first lap of the race Danny has definitely been the controlling factor here all day well the leaders have run away from the rest of the field only three are actually running running on the leader lap and Rick Mears leads a contingent from fourth place that runs one lap down it's interesting how backwards things are developing from what people expected. They certainly were thought that the race of this time would change the track condition, that Rick Mears, who's the master of that sort of thing, would be way out front. Instead, it's Danny Sullivan, not known to be a great expert on the oval. Danny Sullivan comes around Ari Leyendijk, who was up in the leader serial for a while, but has now dropped back to 13th position and four laps behind the leader with all the repairs they've had to do on his car when he touched Ludwig Heimrath a bit earlier. Another one, there's Danny right behind Michael Andretti. Michael had somewhat of a slow day also. Been trying to play catch up all day. Normally, Michael just terribly fast at Indianapolis. So approaching now the halfway point in the Indianapolis 500, 90 laps complete as we look down from the blimp as Danny Sullivan with incredible precision moves that car around this speedway at 200 miles an hour his last lap most of the cars averaging between 197 and 200 and the blimp of course is the enterprise from Pompano Beach Florida cameraman on board is Bill Sullivan this is the 40th year that a Goodyear blimp has appeared at the Indy 500 Sullivan surprisingly slow there what is going on here Danny Sullivan 
as his teammate Rick Mears comes past and comes back onto the leader lap. Now, is that a problem with Sullivan or is that strategy? Is it tactics? Well, Rick has been trying to do this. Well, I'm going to have to call all day for a long time, Paul. He's been trying to get him back. Now he needs a yellow flag. If he does, There's he's going to come Pepe. right back around being the same lap with Danny Sullivan. Then we're going to have another race right on the same team. So Rick Mears comes back onto the leader lap. There are now four cars on the leader, and Roger's pretty pleased with that situation. And you can see Roger's not playing a team deal against each other. He's Rick's man. He's for Rick winning. Even though he owns Danny's car, Roger wants Rick to win the race. Well, the fact that Rick was able to do that, Bobby Unger, does that mean that Rick has been saving his car all along as Danny Sullivan comes around Michael Andretti? Does that mean that he's just been playing it very cagey? I don't believe so, Paul. I think it's just a mere matter that Danny got caught trying to be... He's really mad in control of all this race. Yellow flag. Can rolling on the cap. Yeah, a little beer can probably. Soda pop can, something like that. That should bring the yellow out. But at any rate, Danny was just probably a little bit careful, and Rick just snuck up on him. So at the Indianapolis 500, because of a uh, can rolling across the 500 track, the yellow is out once again, and we'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500 after this commercial and a word from our local stations. We're back at the Indianapolis 500, where moments ago Danny Sullivan made this pit stop. You can see an adjustment to the right front wing on the car, and Danny Sullivan sits in the pits, working on the edge of that right wing. Well, what's happening is the wing adjustment screw is broken. Something is broken in there. Looks like it may be the same thing on Al's car. They're taping the adjustment of the wings down so the wing doesn't move. So they won't have any adjustment. This could impair their speed a little bit. Remember, these are brand new PC-17 cars. There's a small device that allows you to adjust the attack angle of the wing, but it sounds like they're concerned that the wings are slipping out of position. That's exactly what's happened, and it looks like it's happened to both cars. Now, that also means that it may be happening to Rick's car, too. So we are under yellow while the officials check the entire race course when you have a small piece of debris like a beer can it can become incredibly dangerous and they've taken the opportunity with the yellow light out to check the entire surface and make sure here is jim crawford he is the new leader of the race a wonderful story he started way back in 18th place from scotland at 40 years old and he is driving with one of those buick engines it's the engine paul that buick has to be so proud of today but Really, a lot of people didn't think that that car would still be in the race, but not only is it in, it's going very fast and has been most of the day. And he will acknowledge the green flag a year ago. His feet were badly injured in a practice accident here. Today, he is leading the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Chasing him is, in second place, Rick Mears, who got an incredibly great break with the way that yellow came out just after Rick Mears jumped past Danny Sullivan to get back onto the leader lap. Crawford's story, you alluded to his injury, is an extraordinary one. He had wound up with a big hole, really, the size of a silver dollar in his right foot as a result of a qualifying crash here last year. He did not make the race. He suffered an immense pain six, seven months all through the winter. In fact, he was taken, he lives here in Indianapolis on the outskirts. He was taken to the hospital every day for two hours of therapy. The ride in was so painful, he'd sit in the back seat with his front legs draped over the front seat with his wife trying to encourage him. And can you imagine, with all that behind him now, what he must be feeling leading the Indianapolis 500. Of all of the people here, maybe it means more to Jim Crawford than almost anyone to see him there. Incredible elation for this smiling man, Jim Crawford. But Bobby, look how low he's cutting under the yellow. But Sooner or later, the official's going to say something about that. No, they won't. They realize the track is slippery, but here we are. Jim Crawford's actually the leader of the race, but way back in the back stereo-wise, so he's got an awful lot of traffic to go to. That's the reason he's running down there. All right, Jim Crawford leads. Rick Mears is in second place. Now let's get an update on the condition of driver Steve Chassis. Here's Brian Hammond. Paul, we saw Steve Chassis being taken from his car on a backboard. Dr. Hank Bach is with us now. What is the condition of Steve Chassis? Steve Chassis is awake and talking and appears not to have any uh, least objective signs of injury. However, he had a brief unconscious episode on the racetrack after the incident. And because of that, we're sending him down to Methodist Hospital Emergency and Trauma Center for further evaluation. The backboard was just precautionary? Yes, that's routine when someone is injured on the track. All right, the news seems to be good from here at the infield hospital, Paul. Well, that is, in fact, good news for Steve Chassis. And just as Dr. Fox suggested, 
whenever they have any question at all, they don't take any chances. They take their time. They strap the driver down to a backboard, make sure he's in good shape. Bobby Rahal right now is behind Jim Crawford. Now, Rahal is running in eighth place. He's well off the pace, a lap behind the leader. But if he could catch up with Crawford, then he could get back on that leader lap. He just got passed by Crawford. Uh, Crawford is lapping Bobby Ray Hall again. I don't know exactly how many times, but Crawford is on the move. He's just got to get through all that traffic right now, and it's holding him up a lot, Paul. So Jim Crawford works his way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the best moment of his racing career as he leads the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Paul, it's also rumored that these D6 Buicks that Jim Crawford is driving today have more horsepower by probably 30 or 40 more than even the Chevrolet's do. So Jim Crawford works his way through the North Chute, leading the Indianapolis 500. The power is Buick, and the car is incredibly fast. He is now on the main stretch, and as he flashes across the line this time, 100 laps will be complete, the halfway point of the Indianapolis 500. Bobby mentions the power of the Buick. I think a dimension of that power is that it's a torquey engine. It accelerates very well. And in this particular race where there have been so many yellows, the traffic has been bunched up, and most importantly, the turn speeds are down because of the slick condition. The ability of that Buick engine to accelerate better than the others is proving to be an important point. The Chevrolet engines find their power at the top end of their RPM band. They're very good at top speed. Crawford has the acceleration. I think it's making a difference. Tom good horsepower, right, Sam? <laughs> I think, in fact, what's being further suggested, though, is the fact that the torque of that engine may help on a slippery track. It certainly does, Paul. Just exactly what Sam said. It gets off the turn. If it has to, a little slower. And down the straightaway. So there's... Well, win. here is the number one car of Al Unser, currently running in third place. Rick Mears currently runs in second. Oh! And no. Danny Sullivan cracks the wall. Danny Sullivan, he had a glory hit it again. He has no control over that car. Ricochets off the wall again, and the yellow flag comes out. Paul, he loses the steering, he loses his brakes, he loses the whole thing when that happens. He's just merely riding along in the car. There's Danny from the in-car camp trying to get out. He doesn't know if there's a fire, doesn't know anything, so he's hurrying as much as he can. A lot of straps, a lot of hoses to unhook to get out. By now, he knows he's in good shape. And listen to the crowd as they acknowledge the triumph of man over disaster. Danny Sullivan climbs from his car, but his Indianapolis 500, which had so much promise, is over, and he's terribly frustrated. That man has certainly dominated half of this race. It looked as if he was, and we'll have another look, but as if he was caught out by the turbulence uh, of the car that was immediately ahead of him as he was exiting turn one. Sam, I just want to make a note real quick on Roger Penske. Roger doesn't like to see Danny out, but his train of thinking has never quit. He's going to have Rick Mears win the race. He is Rick Mears' man, like we said earlier. So just past the halfway point, actually at 102 laps, Danny Sullivan cracks the wall, climbs out of his car. He lapped at 176 miles an hour just before that. Girlfriend Julie, disappointed, worrying. Average speed of the race at 146 miles an hour. Let's go back and take a look now. Danny Sullivan, the third car in this string, just simply comes off high. This has been an accident, Bobby, that we've seen in practice, twice with Pancho Carter, once with Johnny Rutherford. They're just suddenly high and up into the wall. In this particular case, Paul, I have to give you what I think the answer is, and that's that right front wing. Remember when he came in for the last pit stop? The wing adjuster is broken. He's got it taped up, and here comes Rick and Alan in the pit. All right, the Penske team has their work at hand because Rick is now leading the race under the yellow, and Al is in second place. All right, there's... there's Rick in the pits now. It's going to be interesting to see. He apparently has no front end wing problems. No wing problems on the front of his. Al is already out. But they have chosen to change four tires on this car as Rick Mears rolls back into the action. But while he was in the pits, Jim Crawford got past, and Jim should have reassumed the lead in doing so. Al Unser made a routine stop as well, but there's the third Penske car. That magnificent front row and the possible finish first, second, and third has come to an end. From the race camp, there it is. Whoa, what a slam. Well, that was a hard hit, Paul. A piece of the bodywork comes up 
and there is the second hit because as we noted once the car hit the wall the steering and the braking was gone drivers react to things so fast i bet you danny went through a whole cycle of emotional letdown even before that car came to a stop you saw how quickly he flipped the wheel out of the way so that he could get out of the car here we look at it again the car slaps the wall it is now totally out of control danny can do nothing He's simply a passenger, and the wall is coming up again so very quickly. You can Fortunately, even see the he, liquid coming out of the bottom of it there. He just wore out the whole right side of that thing. So. Fortunately, he climbed out of the car rather quickly, so I suspect he's not injured. Here is another angle. Whoa. Already has hit the first time, slaps the wall the second time. So Danny Sullivan, who dominated the early going in the Indianapolis 500, is out of the race as a result of an accident in the south end of the track. We'll be back. Well, the onboard camera is still working, though Danny <laughs> Sullivan's car is not, and it is on the hook on a wrecker down in the south end of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Danny Sullivan dominated the early going, but at 102 laps brought out our 10th caution period of the Indianapolis 500. And the Penske team is back in front. We watched Jim Crawford, who was the leader just before going into the pits. The Penske team got past. Jim Crawford will slide into third place. Let's go to the pits now in Jackaroo. See this little pin here? It says, I with a heart, Danny Sullivan. Julie Nini certainly does that. And Julie, uh, Danny's out of the race. What are your feelings? Um, real disappointment. Uh, I guess it's like they say, you never win the race till it's over. And we really thought he had a good chance here. He was running really well. And I think they made a couple of bum calls on the yellows and kind of gave some other people that were really a lap down, gave them a lap by putting the pace car in front of him. How difficult is it for someone like you to, to sit here and see this race unfold from the perspective of a pit watcher versus maybe being inside the car, sitting up in the grandstands? Oh, it's totally different being in the pits. You really know what's going on every minute, whereas up in the stands, you really don't know what's going on. Um, as for being in the pits during this, it's been very exciting up until this moment. I guess without a real super play on words, right now, though, life is the pits for Julie Nini. Back to you. Wayne Sweetie waves the green flag. The two yellow Penske cars come to the inside, and Al Unser leads. Rick Mears into the first turn as we're back to green flag racing once again. Penske first and second. If Al Unser completes this lap in the lead, he will set a new all-time Indianapolis record for laps led. The current holder as of this second is still Ralph De Palma, who raced in the first Indianapolis back in 1911. But if Big Al hangs on and stays ahead of Rick, he will take by one lap the lead in that age-old contest. Let's Over. keep in mind as we watch these two cars, Sam, uh, Al has a wing problem on the front, and we'll have to see if it's going to affect him now as the race progresses. All right, let's consider the situation with Jim Crawford, who now has fallen back in the field just a little bit with those pit stops. But Jim Crawford, the first race that he's run this year, led for a bit, and we may see it again, the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Last year, he finished 16th. He started 18th today and has come up to challenge the best in the business. Al Unser, the leader of the Indianapolis 500 at a 108 laps complete of the 200 schedule. And he did do the record. He has now completed 614 laps during his career in the lead in the Indianapolis 500. That is more than three full races in the lead. Extraordinary achievement. Absolutely remarkable achievement for Al Unser, this man, the defending Indianapolis 500 champion. You can still see the tape on the left front wing, Paul, but it doesn't seem to be hurting his speed right now. Al's hooked up, going very fast. Well, Bobby, yeah, the yellow, yellow flag, flag. Uh, you saw the pace car come out. No indication yet as to why that yellow may have come out. <laughs> We have an indication from race control that car number five, that is Rick Mears, hit a rabbit out on the racetrack. So they brought out the yellow, and the question is, is Rick Mears' car damaged? So once again, we are under yellow at the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back. At the 72nd running of the Indianapolis 500, 111 laps complete, we are under yellow. Al Unser, the defending champion, leads it, followed by his teammate Rick Mears. Buick-powered machine of Jim Crawford. Two Chevings and a Buick. Raul Boisel 
sits in fourth place, and Michael Andretti currently runs in fifth place. Danny Sullivan has led, as has Rick Mears, Alan Zer Sr., and Jim Crawford. 111 laps complete, five different leaders. We just gave them to you the average speed way down at 140 miles an hour, and 11 cars are out of the Indianapolis 500 thus far. Those out of the race, most of them owing to accidents. Guerrero, Brayton, Bentonhausen, engine problems for Fox and Daly, Teo Fabi with an oil leak, and then several accidents. Now, as we watch the field on the back stretch, behind the pace car, and under the yellow flag, now let's take a look here and see if we can analyze this last yellow flag. Watch the lead car. That's Al Unser. Rick Mir is right behind. Now look down to the lower left-hand corner of the screen. You see a rabbit in his last seconds. Now he was hit by Al and then by Rick at over 190 miles an hour. As a result of that, the yellow flag came out, and we are back running under the green flag. Al Unser, Rick Mears, first and second, third place, the 15 car of Jim Crawford. Pinsky started with three cars on the front row. He now has two cars left, and they're running in first and second. The Chevrolet engines, a question mark of last year. Mario Andretti failed in the final laps of the race. And look at this. Rick Mears goes past and picks up the lead of the Indianapolis 500. A man who was a one-time, one lap down, but who knows how to save a race car and a team who knows how to tune it in the running. Peter Parrott and Roger Penske have to really be happy about that. Chris Mears, Rick's wife, just keeps scoring the car, but now she can write it in the top of the column as number one. And there she sees it. Rick is certainly hooked up right now. It's going to be interesting to see if the rabbit did any damage to either car. It would appear by looking at him like it really didn't, Paul, but they, Rick certainly drove by Al like he was part. Certainly doesn't appear so. I think the rabbit was run over by the wheel, uh, and since the tire wasn't punctured, my assessment is probably the car is all right. The interesting thing here is we talked earlier about the fact that Rick uh, was apparently almost out of the race there for a while in the early going. All sorts of trouble. He made an extra pit stop under the green. And if you gentlemen remember, he'll be doing very badly. But such as the quick way this race changes around, suddenly he is way out front. Well, this team has dominated the entire month of May. The Penske team, qualified cars, first, second, and third on the front row. As Rick Mears and Allen's are work their way around the track. Two identical cars, Paul, set up a little bit differently, but two identical cars, two good drivers. And we should remind you as we watch Rick Mears that Al Unser Jr. has climbed back into his car and is running in the race, though he is 20 laps behind this car of Rick Mears and running in 21st position, but still he did climb back in. The crew repaired it and he has kept going. Rick Mears on the main straightaway. Al Unser right behind. Rick Mears looking at 207.3 miles an hour for Rick Mears. He has really picked up the pace. They've been averaging down around 200 miles an hour, and now, boy, Bobby, that pace is really coming up. Keep in mind, though, Rick was complaining earlier about the light fuel load versus the heavy fuel load. Like when the fuel gets down, Paul, it isn't handling so good. So it's going to be super interesting. Let's watch and see if he does slow down when his fuel load gets a little lighter. You know, one of the interesting design aspects of these new Penske cars is they've designed the fuel load positioning in such a way that it won't ruin the tires when it's running heavy and keep the front tires able to race when the car is light and finally capable of running fast. Well. Rick is about two and a half seconds ahead of Al, and the idea of that fuel load going down like that is so the car, like you said, will stay the same. But it still comes down to the track being loose to a degree and to the ch chassis setup being right or wrong, Paul. Well, also, the point is that this team, the designer, Nigel Bennett, is very sensitive to how the tires work because he used to be himself a tire engineer for Firestone. So Rick Mears turning laps to 205 miles an hour and leading the Indianapolis 500. The question to him, we have a problem. We have a problem on the course as the 17 car of Johnny Rutherford slaps into the wall and another great champion's day is over. The three-time winner hoping for his fourth, the teammate of Jim Crawford, 
Johnny's obviously all right. He's waiting for all of the cars to come past and slow down before he considers climbing out of that cockpit. There's his rescuing crew. He had a crash here in practice uh, two weeks ago now. And interestingly, because they had to work hard to get Rutherford's car back in shape, it curtailed his teammates Crawford further testing and development. The Indianapolis 500 punctuated now by its 12th yellow light, and that's keeping the average speed of the race down at 140 miles an hour, though when they're running, Rick Mears has been running very fast indeed. Johnny Rutherford stands up and climbs out of his badly damaged Buick-powered machine and walks away. A wave to the fans. That's a champion. So Johnny Rutherford, let's take a look. Third car. And Rutherford, vastly similar to the Sullivan accident, vastly similar to the uh. accident that he had before in practice. The car just comes off the corner high. Now, Bobby Unser, let's examine this. We, we keep saying that the track is slippery, but we've seen the same accident on a very, very smooth and good track in practice. Well, it looked to me like something broke in his right front on the wheel. The wheel was crooked when he came out of the turn. And here's the first and second place cars taking advantage of the yellow. The Penske team with their usual coordination comes into the pits. Al Unser and Rick Mears. The pits there are side by side. Now you get a good idea of both teams in action. We're both cars up on the jacks. We're only on the 118th lap, and already we have had two more yellow flags than we had in the entire race last year. Let's go to the pits, Jackaroo. Well, it was incredible to watch these two teams go to work, both of them under the aegis of Roger Penske. What Roger did just moments before both Al Unser Sr. and Rick Mears pitted is he called down to Al Unser Sr.'s crew and said, move those tires so Rick has a clear run in. So he's still calling the shots for both your first and second place man. Back to you. So while they clean up the debris from Johnny Rutherford's accident, the new leader of the race after pit stops by the Penske team is Jim Crawford. 118 laps are complete. We'll be back. Plus 500 under yellow as a result of Johnny Rutherford's accident. There is his shattered machine. Belongs to car owner Kenny Bernstein, the world reigning champion in funny car in NHRA. His other car, Jim Crawford, still out running in third place and doing rather well today. Now let's consider this accident, Sam Posey. All right, here's Rutherford's car right here. And you see that he has from here to here before he hits the wall. That is probably at least 250 to 300 feet. Now watch him uh, as he approaches. Here he is here coming in he hits the wall good and hard there and the question is why we've now seen this kind of accident three times well twice in this race but a number of times during uh, practice and qualification the minute any of these cars this year gets a little wide of the line the drivers are unable to uh, complete the turn and incidentally let me just show you for a second what what it looks like if this is a diagram of the turn one of these long 900 foot Indianapolis radius turns. If this, uh, if this, all right, if, if this is a look at the, uh, just a diagram of one of these 900 foot radius turns here at Indianapolis, the driver comes in like this, bears down toward the inside of the turn. He's trying to make it as long a curve, keep up as much speed as he possibly can. And it's right in here that he has the trouble. He goes out like that instead of being able to do that. So some sort of pushing condition, driving them up into the wall. Green flag once again. The leader, Rick Mears, followed by Al Unser, and they are well down in this pack owing to the pit stop made during this yellow flag. Out for Johnny Rutherford. Rick Mears, that Number five machine, bright yellow, tries to work his way through traffic, and Al Unser is caught back behind Raul Boisel. You're looking for Michael Andretti's car. The camera position just over the gearbox, and just back you can see the yellow car of Rick Mears. And very shortly, you'll probably see it a whole lot closer. You know, Michael Andretti all month long has been operating in the shadow of the Penske team and his father, a front runner throughout most of last season. This year, he hasn't had that all-out speed. He has the Cosworth engine instead of the Chevrolet, which has been so fast. And I talked to him the other day, and he said, you know, I really don't mind this. I haven't been in the glare of publicity. He is coming up steadily throughout this race, and we may not have heard the last for Michael Andretti. He's sixth right now. 
Michael Andretti running in eighth, but here comes Al Unzer to challenge Rick Mears for the lead. And Big Al looks like he has the lead back. The battle just back there as they come off the, the first turn. Now, both of them battle. Slower cars in front of him. Rick takes the lead again. Rick goes down. He has to tiptoe on the inside of Billy Bukovic, the third. But it is still a fight for the lead. Big Al had it for a moment. Then Rick Mears took it back. Now he darts out into the inside. Big Al follows suit as he comes to the inside again. Both of them pushing the slower car to the higher side, but Al drops in behind. Well, you might say to yourself, Paul, is it foolish for Roger Penske, who owns both these cars and poised both these men, to let them race, to let it be a, a heightened situation of danger out here? Why not give orders? One of you drop back. Perhaps Al Sr. drop back. But no, Roger feels that he employs professionals, he employs the best, and he thinks the best thing to do is let them race. Looking back from Michael Andretti's car, you have to remember, every time they've come past Roger Penske, they've been fairly normally lined up. All of that action took place out of his view. Maybe they knew it. <laughs> That's a good point. So it is now Rick Mears, challenged for the moment by Big Al, and a tremendous fight at the front of the Indianapolis 500. Yes, yeah, and a nice view from the ABC camera. Rick pulling away a little bit, but it looks like Al has kind of gotten out of the traffic and be interesting to see if he can pull look, up on Rick a little Look at Rick work his way in now as he closes down behind Michael. Comes right up behind him, darts to the inside. And close by. That's the difference between the Chevrolet power and the Cosworth power, at least partly. Michael's car probably not handling quite as well as Rick's either. But the Chevrolet has 30 to 40 horsepower more than the Cosworth. And on this fast track, it makes a big difference. Perhaps more importantly, the Chevy Indy V8 was designed specifically for this track. It was designed to develop 12,500 horsepower down these 5 eighths of a mile straightaway. Rick Mears. 12,500 RPM, not horsepower. Exactly. RPM. RPM. Just cut that last lap at 203 miles an hour. So Rick, when he wants to, can certainly pick up the pace. There Rick he Mears. is. There he is. He's trying to lap traffic, Paul. There's coming up on traffic. He has no problem if he can just get a straightaway or two. If he can off there a little bit. When that car runs down to the left, that kind of ruins the air for him, so he has to back off just a little bit so his wings can get them through there. This is what the other competitors in the Indy 500 are terrified of. Rick Mears in the lead, feeling good and pulling away. The pole sitter who dominated the speed in, in qualifying, now uh, well after the halfway point in the race, apparently with a healthy car, suddenly pulling away. This could be the beginning of the end for the competition. The question that we started at the beginning of the day, can the Penske team dominate? We look for Michael's car as Rick Mears sits ahead, followed by his teammate, Big Al, and Jim Crawford, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Bobby Rahal up into the top five. We'll be back with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this commercial and a word from our local station. We are back live at the 72nd running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race as Chris Mears times her husband Rick circling this track at better than 200 miles an hour and leading the Indianapolis 500. I'm Paul Page with Sam Posey, Bobby Unzer, Brian Hammonds, and Jack Aru. We've had a tremendous amount of attrition, though not as bad as in previous years. Still, there are plenty of cars out. There's the leaderboard of the top five, perhaps most notable, is that Bobby Rahal is slowly working his way up toward the front of the race. He has a different engine. That could be a factor. We'll talk about that in just a moment. While there has been great fighting all the way around the track, you're only scored at the starting line, and four different drivers have led this 500-mile race. Danny Sullivan, Rick Mears, Al Unzer, and Jim Crawford. Bobby Rahal, there he is, car number four. He runs in fifth place right now. He's been down in the serial, and they did report that there was a slipping clutch, but still, he is working his way up. Accidents have been a factor here as well. They began on the first lap. We have had now 12 yellow lights during the running of the Indianapolis 500. Only one injury has required hospitalization. That is Steve Chassie, who passed out for just a moment after contact with the wall, and they decided as a precaution to take him to the hospital. Just ahead of Bobby Ray Hall, you can see the number 20 car. That's two-time world driving champion Emerson Fittipaldi, currently running in fourth place. So at the Indianapolis 500, 141 miles an hour the average, Sam Post. Those poles that you see on the right flashing by are precisely 50 feet apart. So anybody who has a swimming pool or something that's 50 feet long and they have an idea what that means, look at them go by. 
at 200 plus miles an hour. They're gobbling up a football field every second at Indianapolis. Bobby Rahal, magnificent onboard pictures. Our crew's really done a wonderful job with the shots here today at the Indianapolis 500. And Bobby, Bobby Rahal's engine is a Judd. They say that it gets better fuel economy. Is there a strategy here as he works his way up position by position to the front? Well, there, there was when they started the race. We've had so many yellow flags or caution flags since the beginning of this race that it really hasn't let Bobby Ray Hall have any advantages from any increased mileage. The yellow flags have just kept coming. But we've got a long ways to go till the end of the race. They could start trying to work that strategy in a little bit. You can hear the engine as we go along. It hardly changes RPM that he's turning about 11 and a half thousand rpm all the way around the track now he's going to need a lot of fuel stops without yellow flags then we'll see if that fuel mileage really works bobby ray hall 1986 winner of the indianapolis 500 but at the lead of this race the penske team rick Mir and al unser what are their tactics their strategy let's go to jackaroo well, Paul Page, right now you're looking at the brain trust that's been ensconced over here in Al Unser Sr.'s pit. You notice the different uniforms, one red, one gold, and one yellow? Well, that's about as close as you come to teamwork when you look at the Penske operation. Each team makes their own calls. I've chatted repeatedly throughout the day with Roger Penske. He said, no, we've left it up to each individual team. There will not be the type of team driving that we see let us say on Formula One races, like the one that we had on the air a couple of weeks ago from Monaco. Each team, Allenser Sr. and Rick Mears, are going for the win all by themselves. Back up to you. Well, Rick Mears just turned a lap at 203 miles an hour. He's averaging at 142.8 miles an hour, well behind the pace of the fastest lap at the Indianapolis 500-mile race. So Rick Mears leads it. Big Al is in second place, and we'll be back with more in a moment. The view from high above the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Rick Mears works his way around, and you're watching from the Airship Enterprise, the Goodyear Blimp, based in Pompano Beach, Florida. Rick Mears leads the race. Al Unzer is in second place. The third member of the team, Danny Sullivan, who dominated so much in the early going, smacked the wall, fortunately was not injured, but his car badly destroyed out of the race, and now Danny stands with Brian Hammond. Danny has been released from the infield hospital. First of all, Danny, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I've got a, quite a big bruise on the inside of my left knee just where it hit uh, the steering column in the car, but other than that, I'm fine. We've got some graphic pictures from the in-car camera, the race cam. From your perspective, what happened? Well, we had had a problem with the wing adjuster for the front wings, and I'd been losing some ground because I had too much push, and then all of a sudden, I went into turn one. I had the push. Not too big of a problem, and then the front just gave up. Whether the wing collapsed or, or turned the other way, I don't know. And it just took off and drove right in the wall. Pretty hard hit. Hard enough. Everybody's complaining about the track conditions. How were they for you? Well, we ran a lot of laps at 210 with full tanks. I didn't think they were that bad. You know, they're going to get slippery because there's a lot of cars running around. It's a hot day, but it, I thought they were pretty good. I don't know if it's consolation, but your two teammates are going at it head to tail right now. Who do you like in that battle? Uh, either one of them. I'll take either one. But I think, <clears throat> you know, Rick had had some problems early on. I know he sorted them out, so he's, he's got to be pretty strong. You know, Roger's pretty cagey when it comes to running that car. All right, Danny Sullivan is okay. He goes from being a leader to this race to a cheerleader as his two teammates are running first and second now. Paul? And Mario Andretti, car number six, rolls to the side of the track. Remember, this was a car with a gearbox problem. They got it back in the race. The yellow flag is out because Mario is sitting up in a dangerous position on the track. But apparently, Mario with newer and further problems. Boy, just another tough day for Mario. Bobby, Bobby Ray Hall into the pits. And Looks the, like it's a normal stop. Yeah, several of the crews were ready for stops at about this point in the race. In fact, Al Unser's crew laid the tires out ready for a stop and then the yellow came out for them and then they stepped back out of the way so the yellow comes apparently at a very opportune time for a number of individuals a car with the number four on it incidentally has never won the indy 500 except in a year ending in zero like 70 60. bobby ray all accelerating very very fast though back out onto the track these cars do zero to 100 in less than five seconds all right 
and here comes the leader, Rick Mears, rolling down the pit road as he comes up behind Emerson Fittipaldi, and let's go to Jack Aruth. And the Penske Brigade is ready to first service Rick Mears. Many people say that he is the lead driver on the team. He comes to a stop. The jacks go up, and it looks as if, yes, they are going to change all four tires and take on fuel. Rick continuing to pump the accelerator to keep the revs up on his Chevrolet engine. They have completed their work. They drop the jack, and he puts it in gear. Has a little bit of a problem there, but he is off and away. Meanwhile, further on up pit road, his teammate, the guy that runs in second, Alan Sir Sr., their crew is still waiting for Sr. Back to you. So Rick Mears in and out of the pits and may have been able to maintain the lead during that stop. Here comes Al Unser. He is on the pit road and coming into some of that Penske performance service. And right behind him, Michael Andretti comes in as well. Michael running in fifth place. Al sits in the cockpit. These seconds tick by so very slowly for the race driver who has been running at 200 miles an hour. And you're so disoriented, Paul, because your world has become that world of 200 miles an hour that we've been seeing from the in-car cameras. And it's, it's more awkward, actually, to be stopped than to be at speed. The driver doesn't feel a sense of relief until he's back at speed. Well, you saw Michael Andretti come out of the pits ahead of Al Unser Sr. But now Al rolls back into the action. So Rick Mears leads it. He stops under the yellow because Mario Andretti has pulled off the course. Mears just put a lap on Al right there. I think he just flashed around it. There's Mario under tow, and they'll bring him back into the pits at the Indianapolis 500. Mario Andretti, car number six, and you can hear the crowd acknowledging his efforts here today. Giant crowd. Now, you take a look at this track. They go around in 43 seconds. That's not so long, but they're traveling so fast it's sometimes very difficult to tell just how big this giant oval is. Jack Aroot has this report. Almost 250 acres are contained within Indy's 2.5 mile track, but to visualize its true size, consider another home of fantasy, Mickey's Kingdom in Disneyland. As any parent will tell you, it takes at least a full day to enjoy the Disney empire. But imagine if you had to do it in three days. It would take three Disneylands to fill this Indy Speedway infield. Or how about one of the world's tallest structures? The Empire State Building in New York has been viewed by billions and has been scaled by the legendary King Kong in the movies. Now, what if Kong had prevailed and tipped the Empire State Building over? Well, it wouldn't have reached one-third of the way from one turn to the other. Or how about the Rose Bowl? With seats of over 100,000, it's one of football's largest facilities. But if you arranged a group of Rose Bowls like a carton of eggs and sat them in the middle of the infield at Indy, you'd end up with a full 15 inside the track. So the next time you want to describe something as gigantic, just tell them it's as big as the Indy infield. Mario Andretti sits in the pits with a problem as big as the Indy infield. The second time that he has spent time in the pits, and as you can see, they're working at the back of his car, and that's not a good sign. Now, in slow motion, Bobby Unser, are you worried about something breaking in the suspension? This is his accident again. Yes, Paul. It and he was, was fighting something. it. It was just pushing into the wall. Well, yes, it looked... I saw another shot where it looked like the water had come out. Not the suspension breaking on Danny's car, but possibly some uh, something coming out from the front. Remember, he could have had that wing break. I still think that there's a series there of unexplained accidents that they'll have to examine again. We're under yellow. We'll be back with more from Indianapolis in a moment. We're back at the Indianapolis 500. I'm Paul Page. We take a look at the leaderboard. Rick Mears now has a full lap on the entire field, reversing his position of being a lap down that he was in just a few minutes ago. Crawford. Big Al, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Bobby Rahal round out the top five. But Al Unser has been having some problems with his car. They've been working on it, trying to get it in proper shape. 144 laps complete, six different leaders, and 10 lead changes. Let's go down to Jack Aroot now. Paul, in that last series of pit stops between your first and second place runners, Al Unser Sr. and Rick Mears, Mears leading, the difference was eight seconds. Al Unser Sr. took eight seconds more in the pits. Now, that's equal to about 850 yards on the racetrack, but let me show you what accounted for approximately five seconds of that stop. You see this wheel here? This is the wheel that we're very much used to in IndyCar racing. It's open, and the lug goes right here on the wheel. The wheel nut goes right on the lug here. 
These are the new type of wheels that the Penske team and many others are using. It's a more aerodynamic wheel, very similar to what we saw on the Olympic cycling events. You know that slick, solid wheel? But look, in order to get the wheel nut on, you've got to get into a blind spot here. That's exactly what happened on the right <coughs> rear tire of Al Unser Sr.'s car. The crewman could not get the wheel nut securely positioned, and it took him all of five and a half seconds to make the tire exchange. That's almost 550 yards out on the racetrack. Back up to you. Yeah, but get that kind of performance out of your local garage. <laughs> well, Bobby Unser, we are under the yellow. An interesting race. Rick Mears comes from behind, starts the front row, drops back a full lap, now goes to a full lap ahead as we're ready to go green. Well, he did, Paul. He was back a lap, and now he's up a lap. Rick is on a hot cell right now. He's really sticking good, too. He's going very fast. Here we come down to the green flag now. The giant crowd cheers Rick Mears on as we're back to racing with 145 laps of the 200 complete. You know, it's interesting when you said a giant crowd cheers Rick Mears on. You would think the Penske team, with all of their power, their money, their dynastic approach to this racing, five victories in the last nine Indy races, might be hated by some the way the New York Yankees were hated. Remember back in the 50s and early 60s when they had that dynasty going? Instead, the Penske team is immensely popular with everybody I talk to. And I really wonder uh, if that isn't partly because you see Roger himself out there winning and losing, the general standing there with his troops. He doesn't make his decisions from the suite and blame somebody else. You see him right there making the decisions that have propelled Rick Mears up into the lead to the point where he was back in fifth and sixth place. And also, I think Rick Mears, Danny Sullivan, Al Sr. are so popular as human beings that I think this whole thing works despite the fact they come in here with what is basically almost an unfair advantage. And Al Unser has moved around Jim Crawford and picked up second place in just those few seconds from the green flag. But remember, this is a battle that is one lap behind the leader, Rick Mears, a full two and a half miles back. I think another reason, Sam Posey, is the 30 or so members of the Penske team may be just about the nicest individuals you'd ever want to meet. They always have time for the fans. They have plenty of time to explain the cars. They're just a group of nice people. Well, what looks like first and second on the racetrack. Again, Al's down a lap. He must pass Rick in order to be competitive. Look at the temperature so he come here. back this full lap. In the 95 90s. degrees. That's hot. Well, that's down in the pits. Everybody's not seeing the same thing. The main problem today is the sun's been beating on that pavement, and it's really hot on the pavement. Makes the tires slippery. Bobby, when you made your pre-race estimate of the slipperiness of the track, that was predicated on the idea it was going to be 85 degrees at this point. It's more than 10 degrees hotter, and I think that extra slipperiness has really been the story of this race. Roger Penske working over the tactics. Jim Crew, Rick Mears comes off the fourth turn. A full lap in front of the rest of the Indianapolis 500 field. You know, so many people say Rick Mears is the best. He's the best oval driver in the world. Now, why? What does it really mean? You think of prize fighting. It's as if you were in a prize fight and you were the guy with the better reach, the better reflexes, more experience than your opponent. When Rick is out there on this racetrack, he has a sense the track all around it what the other men are doing out there how his car is performing what his options are his relationship with roger penske on the radio of course goes back for 10 years so he the two of them have worked through these situations before and so really rick mears is the man who's calmer whose mind is more open to possibilities and to add to that he used to be a desert racer in the baja competition that's how he got started in all this and he has what the desert people call desert eyes, that ability, and Paul, you and I were in the Baja last fall, to see things in that desert, or in this case, on the racetrack, that others don't see. Currents of air, uh, a changing way the, the track is. Rick Mears, right now, very much in control of the situation. And at 205 miles an hour, he has just completed three quarters of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. 150 laps are now complete. Rick Mears, a very private man, away from the track quiet sleeps a lot let's take an opportunity with jackaroo to look at rick mears if genetic engineers created the ultimate indycar driver their blueprint would form a creation with perfect vision superior strengths with second reflexes emotional control computer keen mechanical knowledge and a killer instinct 
the prototype may already exist in the form of 36-year-old Rick Mears. He's a rebel and a runner. He's a signal turning green. He's a restless young romantic, wants to run the big machine. Uh, Rick is very methodical in his approach. Technically, I would have to say understanding the cars of today aerodynamically, mechanically, and understanding how to drive them because of that knowledge, he probably is one of the best. But Rick Mears is human, and besides the functions that make him skillful, human qualities follow him into the cockpit. It's kind of like, I think, with actors, you know, in acting. They get to, when they, when they get on the screen, they get to play a part that, uh, that's not them. And I think that kind of that kind of runs over into the racing. In the racing, I kind of get to do something that's not me. The killer instinct or the selfishness, uh, that's not me, you know, in real life. But in a race car, I kind of get to do that a little bit and get away with it. Real life includes time away from the world of speed. Great shot. Private moments that are known only to those who share the sure man in total, Good like shot. Rick's wife, Chris. Rick's very quiet. He's very, very, very private. What you see in an interview with Rick Mears is exactly the way he is at home. He's exactly like that. Just quiet, low-key, and as normal as normal can get. This Mears normalcy is fashioned around a profession that few see, but provides the foundation for what is the new world man. He's got to make his own mistakes. Interestingly, you know, you saw Rick Mears playing golf there with his wife, Chris, and you can often tell a lot about somebody by how he tries to teach someone else the game of golf. And when Rick is trying to teach Chris golf, he says, Chris, just hit it straight down the fairway. Don't worry about power. Don't worry about technique. Just hit it straight down the fairway. And that's basically the way he lives his life. Nothing flashy, no technique, just do it straight. 154 laps complete. Rick Mears at 202 miles an hour. Fire out in the infield. Tar on fire out there. This is not on the racetrack. And there is plenty of fire equipment here in the grounds. And it seems to be far enough away from the racetrack that none of that smoke would blow across the track. Well back behind the Tower Terrace grandstand to not affect the running of the 500 mile race. The top positions on the track have remained static. But Jim Crawford is now moving up and getting in a position to challenge Al Unser for second place. But I'll tell you, a plume of smoke is going to be entirely visible to the driver, and they're going to wonder where on earth is it coming from. They're going to assume, naturally, you don't have much peripheral vision out there, that it's from somewhere around the track, and it's going to take a lap of some confusion to figure out it isn't from the track. Sam, they won't see that smoke, uh, not unless it comes across the track. They really are only interested in what's on the track at the moment, so far, we have no wind, and the smoke is going straight up. Now, that's really nice. You can see drifting slightly to the north and away from the track itself as we look down from the blimp once again. Rick Mears out in front of the 500-mile race. Look at this magnificent facility that is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, only used once a year for the running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Rick Mears continues his lead, followed by Al Unser Sr. and Jim Crawford. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The yellow just came out, and that brings the crowd to their feet, this massive crowd. Possibly the reason for the yellow is this car, the 23 machine. That's Terrell Pomrock driving in his first oval race, certainly his first Indianapolis 500. He's in 16th position, but the car rolled down below the yellow line, and as a result, they put the yellow flag out. Now, one of the key factors of an Indianapolis 500-mile race is the pit stop competition. We have seen uh, some tremendous stops here today. The Penske team has done a magnificent job. And we saw a moment ago Michael Andretti as he stopped simultaneously with Al Unser. The pit Two stops very make, good stops. Well, exactly. They make you realize how much this is truly a team sport. It isn't just the driver. I mean, actively, the six men that come over the wall to work on the car are part of the race. And uh, their performance has a lot to do with advancing uh, the, their car in the race. Remember, Sam, they're having one more man over the pits. 
ball this year than we had last year. And that probably is some of the answer why the pit stops have been so much faster today. In the top six, we have four different racing engines. As we're slowed under the yellow, and you look over Michael Andretti's right shoulder, running in sixth place on the track. Remember, Rick Mears is a full lap ahead of the second place car of Al Unser. But pit stop competition goes far further here at the Speedway. During the past week, Jack Aroot watched the pit stop competition. These are the tools of nameless men. Men that are the unsung heroes of Indianapolis. The pit crew. And on Thursday, they took center stage before a record crowd for the Miller High Life pit stop competition. The finals pitted the crew of 85 Indy 500 champ Danny Sullivan against last year's winning crew, the Mario Andretti team. The objective is to have the quickest pit stop in an area bordered by two timing lights. And at the drop of the green flag, Andretti roared into the timing box first as Sullivan's car stalled. Andretti's team, led by Colin Duff, went about their work in methodical fashion, changing four tires and simulating a refueling. The Sullivan team managed to refire their car and headed to the box as the Andretti team fired away in 15.151 seconds. Because Sullivan did not break the timing light beam earlier, they were still in the hunt. With the pressure of having witnessed Andretti's flawless stop, the Roger Penske-led brigade showed that from adversity can come triumph as they completed their stop in 14.405 seconds. The Penske pride was riding high, and the emotional impact was evident. Although offsetting infractions required a repeat run, the results were unchanged, and the $25,000 winner's check went to the Sullivan team, their third win in the past four years. And speaking of pit stops, Al Unser Sr. makes his pit stop in the race. Through their work on that machine, and again, working with the front wing of the car. They try and make sure that it doesn't move, taping it once again. Apparently, there is a problem with these cars where the wing moves a little bit, so they add just a little bit of tape to try and support. And during that stop, Jim Crawford got past Al Unser Sr. So everybody appreciates the significance of what would happen if the wing suddenly changed its angle. If it happened in the turn, it would probably mean a crash immediately. So th this is not a casual business. In the first stop, Sam, we noticed that the left front one had problems. Now we notice that he's having problems with the right front. So it looks like he's broken both wing, wing adjusters on Al's car. So still under the yellow flag at the Indianapolis 500 mile race and Rick Mears well out in front of the second place car, which is now Emerson Fittipaldi and Bobby Rahal has moved up to third. We'll be back. under the green flag the 72nd running of the indianapolis 500 164 laps are complete 200 to scheduled distance 500 miles accelerating down the back stretch that is rick mears the chevrolet powered machine in second place now is emerson fittipaldi another chevy and then a buick of jim crawford you mentioned the chevrolet engine in rick mears's car remember there was a car at this same stage in the race last year mario andretti's with a Chevrolet engine in its engine bay. And that car broke down on lap 177. We are on lap 164 right now. It will be interesting to see what happens from here to the end as we look at the race camp from Michael Andretti's car, which you see bringing up the back of that group there. There's Rahal. Bobby Rahal running fifth. Now, the most interesting thing is that the Rick Mears did not stop on the last yellow flag for fuel. Now, what this means is, is that Roger Penske knows that he has a lap on the field. So he's gambling for Rick staying ahead, running in clean air. He's gambling that he's going to have another yellow, or he'll be able to make his last stop. He only needs one more stop for the finish. Still under the green and not lose the lead. Looking back from Bobby Rahal's car, as we watch Al Unser just behind. Now, let's reconsider on lap 160, six laps ago. Al Unser stopped, Michael Andretti stopped, Emerson Fittipaldi stopped, and Bobby Rahal stopped. Now, logic would tell you that at least three of those cars will have to stop again before the finish. Interestingly enough, as you suggested, Bobby Unser, Rick Mears did not stop. No, he didn't. Oh, we just... Oh. Number 48 just blew an engine on the right front straightaway here. Really blew it, too. We could hear it clear up here in the booth. Pulls off the grass, but did he oil down the main stretch? He got to the inside pretty quickly, yeah. 
but they're not going to take a chance. The yellow flag is back out again. Rocky Moran. Good move by Chief Stewart, Tom Binford, and the officials. Don't take a chance of running them down that straightaway at speed with the potential of a lot of oil on there. Don't, don't take a chance. And also, another good move by uh, uh, a driver in the race because Rocky immediately pulled it off to the left, got it off the track as fast as he could. But he crossed the exit to pit lane, leaving oil there. All right, so Rick Mears leads 167 laps, but we're coming to the close of the Indianapolis 500. One name we need to watch is Bobby Rahal. We'll be back. Back at the 72nd Indianapolis 500. About 30 laps to go in this race. And as a result of the last series of pit stops, Rick Mears may have been joined on the leader lap by a number of other cars. And also important is that the officials have determined that going back to green on the 166 lap, car 20, that's Emerson Fittipaldi, passed another car, and so they are going to penalize him one lap. So a scrambling in the order here, and as they come past the line, we'll be able to determine what kind of vulnerability Rick Mears may have. There's Emerson Fittipaldi, and that's the one they say they're going to penalize. Well, they've most certainly been going good, Paul. It's a shame to lose a lap, especially at this time of the race, because he doesn't really have a lot of chance to make it up. It was a very bad decision on Nimble's part, it would appear. He was up briefly to uh, second place in this car, which he didn't really want to run in the race. It's a March car. He wanted to run a Lola car, uh, which the team owned, but could not, or felt they could not prepare uh, quickly enough for the race. So Emerson started this somewhat at odds with his own crew, which is unusual for this very nice man. So there's Emerson Fittipaldi. Let's go down to the pits and check the room. Well, Paul, it was a great move, a gambler's move on Roger Penske to keep Rick Mears out there. How quickly it turned out to be one that was going to pay dividends for them. They were calculating right behind me just how far they could run the string in that tank of fuel so that he would only have to make one final pit stop. They gambled, as Roger said he would, to see if maybe a caution would come out shortly and they could go the distance. They've been looking at Bobby Rahal's situation all day. They know that there's a problem there in as much as being able to go for fuel consumption. But they gambled, and it looks like they may come out a winner. Let's go back to you. And the green flag flies. That's Rick Mears over to the far right of your screen as he comes down and inside Michael Andretti. Rick Mears leads the Indianapolis 500. In second place is Jim Crawford and Michael Andretti. Well, you're on board with Michael Andretti, who runs in third place right now. Now, the result of attrition during the pit stops and Michael and his team have been able to move up, and they've now joined the fight at the front, but Rick Mears is leading the race. So every time he passes somebody right now, Paul, he's putting a lap on him. He said Rick was almost a full lap ahead. He made that last pitch stop, put him back in the same lap. Now he's gained his lap back again. He's definitely the one leading the race. Roger Penske has a saying, which he uses all the time. A foot has 12 inches. Don't go 11 inches and not go that last inch. That must be what he's thinking right now. They are starting to close in on victory of Indianapolis, and it isn't, there's very little left here to go, and you know what's going through Roger's mind. So Rick Mears leads it. Before that series of yellows and pit stops, Rick Mears was a full lap ahead of everyone, but with the stop, Jim Crawford has managed to move back up onto the leader lap, though he is 42 seconds behind Rick Mears. You ride with Michael Andretti. Started 10th, he's currently third. And watch this ride, too. He was trying to slipstream uh, the car in front of him, Bosell, and, uh, and he built up speed. Now watch this, this is a classic move. He's made a good exit. He will start to close in as he comes down the straight because he doesn't have as much res wind resistance as the car in front. But look, he just does not have enough speed. He waved by Rick Mears on the inside. That presence of mind, it just doesn't thing right have there. enough power, does he, Bobby? The interesting think? thing you can see right there is how loose Raul Bosell is. His car just dancing around. The rear is very light. In other Yo. words, got a lot of oversteer. Now, Michael is yeah. very mad, as you can see, because Raul's holding him up. Just not competitive right now, and he thinks that Mario's, or excuse me, thinks that Michael thinks that Raul's holding him up right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and, and he is. He takes him all the way down onto the grass and still can't get by him, and Michael is not a happy man. He has to hope the officials will wave a blue flag, a passing flag, at Bosell. At this time of the day, I don't think, I don't think so either. Well, they're, they're looking.
gonna say they have well, they're holding the passing flag but this goes on for more than a couple more laps maybe and you got to remember that blue flag with the yellow di diagonal is really only an advisory it tells you a competitor is following closely it's not an order to move over and give yep. way yellow flag flies no indication as to why we don't have a report of an accident on the track itself Pace car out so that's the good track. news Interesting thing right here. Bosell and Michael Andretti both have Cosworth engines, so Michael doesn't really have an advantage for passing down the straightaways. Well, the indication is that one of the cars tapped the wall and kept going, the 29 car of Rich Vogler. We'll look for confirmation of that. As the yellow flies again, the field now begins to close. Mario Andretti, finally, after a very long day and two incredibly long pit stops, is out of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Well, there are very few people who I think have had to put up with as much disappointment in sport as Mario Andretti. He has been competitive in this event ever since he came here as a rookie in 1965. And yet, after time after time, and you see his son still in contention, uh, Michael here, time after time, he has come close and only once won it. You know, I think if he won it more toward the middle of his career, it wouldn't have been so brutal, but he won it so early, suggesting he was going to win many more, and ever since, it's been disappointment after disappointment. Well, here's a great story. Jim Crawford, the number 15 car, he's not driven a race this season. He was injured here a year ago, went through a, a long period of therapy. And he's now running in second place on the same lap with the leader. Let's go down into Crawford's pits. Brian Hammonds is there. Well, Jim may have caught a break with this yellow flag. He needs to make one more fuel stop, and they don't think Rick Mears needs to. They, he went by him once. Now they gave him the sign to come in, so he should be coming in for his final fuel stop plus three tires the next time around. Paul? Well, Jim Crawford, the crew there, Bobby. Well, the reason. And another car into the wall. That's Vogler. Isn't it? Well, it certainly looks, looks like, like it. By process of elimination, I think that, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Boy, has he had a physical day. Well, I made that prize fighter analogy. <laughs> Two lands in a row. He obviously had some bad problems there. So it's yellow as Rich Vogler into the wall at the Indianapolis 500, and Rick Mears is still the leader, but now Jim Crawford has a chance to close up. We'll be back. Race day. Time to kick back and taste the high life. Now the sun's hot. The Miller High Life's cold. The cars are ready. And so are you. Stop and taste the high life. Miller. We're back at the Indianapolis 500. This is Paul Page. You're looking at Roger Penske. He talks with Ken Anderson, one of his tacticians in the team and wondering whether or not their car will win this Indianapolis 500. It is out in front at the moment. Now, we're under yellow once again as a result of an accident, this time involving Rich Vogler. Rich Vogler. And we'd mentioned, well, let's take a look at this accident first. There is Rich Vogler, and he is leading Jim Crawford here, Sam. All right, but it's when we see the car from behind that we get a clue as to what might have happened to Rich Vogler, because we see a little smoke coming out of the back of the car right focus on that now let the uh the picture go and you see that smoke in there the, you can see how desperately he's turning the car but at this sam point. You're, you're looking at front wheels going two different directions it yes. looks like a tie rod may have broken yes in the front. we are yep we are yeah, the smoke came coming out of the back, Paul. He's obviously got some problems there. And the engine looks like it just exploded, either the engine or the transmission. No, I, Bobby, I, I think Paul's assessment was good. The front tires were not pointed in the same direction uh, seconds prior to, to impact. I think the smoke we may have been seeing was coming from the tires underneath the car, possibly. They were, he did not have proper line. It's something broke in the front suspension. That, by the way, is the most terrifying thing that can happen to a racing driver when the steering or anything in the front end goes because you are absolutely right, helpless. Look at, look at the left front wheel, which is turning the proper direction on Rich Vogler's car, that car in the upper right-hand corner. But the right front is it's just continuing out. on. 
So something has broken in the steering mechanism on the car. See, the right front tries to turn out while the left front turns in, and he has no control whatsoever. Rich Vogler goes That's into the wall. That's but very obvious. But that obvious. other car was Jim Crawford, second place. How very close he came during that activity. Now, we'd mentioned that officially they had decided to penalize Emerson Fittipaldi, the number 20 car, one lap. Apparently now the officials of the race are reassessing that penalty. More evidence coming forward. They're talking it over again. They may give him the lap back. It would be the first time a penalty like that had ever been assessed to Emerson, who tends not to be the kind of driver to push, uh, to try to push an advantage unfairly. Here is the Jim Crawford pits. Brian Hammonds is there. Things are not going real well down here in the Jim Crawford pits. First of all, the scoring monitor is now gone out. Jim Crawford's radio to his crew is not working. If that's not hectic enough for poor Jim, his wife is very, very pregnant. She's due on Tuesday. She's watching this race up in the suites with her doctor. So, pretty interesting day for the Jim Crawford crew. Paul? Well, it has the potential of being a great week for the Jim Crawford family. Just to restate, though, that he is driving this with a right foot that is still in great pain. I talked to him just the other day. He was standing by the pit wall with his cane, and I said, uh, how do you feel? He said, I got a lot of pain in my right foot. Believe me, I'm not complaining because only two months ago, I couldn't walk at all. So from two months, unable to walk to uh, in and out of the lead at the Indy 500, Jim Crawford has got to have at least a light heart right now. Sam, it appears right now that they put Emerson Fittipaldi back up in the second place or reinstated that lap they took away from him. So that puts him on first, in, or excuse me, second, Jim Crawford in third right now. Well, here comes Rick Mears as the green flag flies again. And by reinstating that lap, that puts Emerson Fittipaldi in second place on the leader lap. And just 10 seconds back as they come to the green from Rick Mears. Jim Crawford moves down to third. There's that white and red machine. That is the 20 car of Emerson Fittipaldi. Back up into second place as they recalculate that lap and that penalty. Emerson told me the other day, I love this race, Sam. He said, so much. I would like to come back here year after year after year and compete in it. He, of course, won the world championship twice. He has won IndyCar races, but never Indy. This may be the best moment in his life, the last eight to ten years since he withdrew from Grand Prix races. What's important to remember is while he has not won Indy, he won a 500-mile race at the Michigan 500. So he very definitely is capable of winning one of these races. He has the savvy, uh, and uh, the Pat Patrick team, which has backed him up, of course, was the architect of that great victory by Gordon John Cox over Rick Mears back in 1982. So once again, it's the Pat Patrick team represented by Emerson Fittipaldi here versus the Roger Penske team re represented by Rick Mears. An age-old rivalry between two car owners that really put a lot into the sport. Yes, and remember, Sam, most people don't think Emerson's an oval track driver. Some days he has good days, and this certainly looks like one of them. I'll tell you what he is. He's very definitely a savvy driver. He knows how to win races. He knows how to save the car to the end of the race. And we have come up on 18 laps from the finish of the Indianapolis 500. And this is a crucial time now. They are all running just as fast as they can. I'll tell you, Emerson is having the kind of day your brother Al had this uh, time last year, uh, Bobby, well back in the early going. But kept coming at it and now he's suddenly a front runner he's been in traffic all day it's been hard for him to get out and get some of that nice clean air like some of the rest of them rick Mears for what has had all day but it's showing up now at the end of the race for him all right down in the patrick pit here is jack and this is pat patrick who's the car owner of emerson fittipaldi's car pat great news that the usac has decided to put you back in second position well we talked to emerson jack and uh, he says he didn't uh he didn't pass the car on the yellow. He went by, and the guy went back behind him, so we feel we're very comfortable. Now, the question, though, is, as I understand it, USAC has also informed you, though, that after the race, they will take a look at the scoring tapes. Is that correct? Well, that's what they say, but it doesn't mean much after the race, does it? That's the story from the Pat Patrick pit. Gentlemen? Emerson Fittipaldi, his driver, runs in second place right now, 10 seconds behind Rick Mears. All right, engines, uh, the engine story. 
Chevrolet engines are currently running first and second. And what does that mean? Will that have an instant effect, you suppose, on Chevrolet uh, sales? I rather doubt it. I think that people out there realize these are highly specialized cars and don't have all that much connection with passenger cars. But what I think will happen is much further down the road, Chevrolet became involved with this for engineering reasons rather than PR goals. They knew there were things about fuel economy and lightness that could eventually trickle down to their production engines. And I think what is going on today will bear fruit five, six, seven years from now. Rick Mears, the leader of the race. Chevy Power, to Penske, BC-17. Yes, that's Rick getting along really nice he should without any problems be able to cruise home to a nice victory today behind him a heck of a battle going on Emmo's changing around we've got Dick Al we've got Jim Crawford there's an interval coming between Rick Mears Everson Fittipaldi we watch for Fittipaldi up. approaching the line now there, 14 seconds back. Emerson Fittipaldi lies back from Rick Mears. Huge lead. You know, Penske has won five of the last nine Indy 500, but only twice has he done so with his own cars. And the last time was back in 1981. There's a lot of car building pride on the line if Penske is able to win this race. His cars manufactured in Poole, England, have not done well in the past four years. And this year, well, Rick Mears probably would have been a hands-down winner at Phoenix had it not been for an early accident. And now here at the Indianapolis 500, Rick Mears may in fact be looking at his third Indianapolis 500-mile race crown. Well, he certainly is. And here comes Ben Apaldi. He isn't gaining on Mears. He just would need some sort of problem from Rick Mears for him to pass him. But he's there. He's competitive. Pat Patrick is not going to give up. Emerson Fittipaldi is certainly not giving up. There's Chris Mears. He's worried, Paul. Fittipaldi maintaining an approximately the same interval that he has the past several laps behind Rick Mears. 14.8 seconds back now. And 19 seconds behind that is the 15 car of Jim Crawford. There is uh, Greg Penske giving the board to their leader. That's Roger Penske Jr. actually handling the board. Telling Rick he's 15 seconds out in front of the Indianapolis 500. And he's turning laps at nearly 201 miles an hour. Well, the, what we're seeing right now, the difference between only building your own cars, as Penske does, and buying them, as Pat Patrick does, uh, for Emerson Fittipaldi, is making itself clear. When you buy a car from a manufacturer, your car is only as good as what they can sell you. And that design tends to be frozen months before the season begins so that a production run of cars can be made. In, in the case of a car, when you build it yourself, you can keep making those changes right up to the last minute, which is precisely what the Penske team, under the direction of Nigel Bennett, their designer, has been doing all month. There's Chris Mears and his wife starting, I would say, to tense up a little bit. Now, we have alluded to time and speeds and penalties throughout the running of this race. We all should be reminded that they are all unofficial until they have time overnight. As soon as they're done with the race, the scoring team, Diamond and Scoring Crew under the direction of Art Graham, go to work and audit the race. They actually run the race on paper with all the uh, replication of timing slips that they have. You can see now they're showing Rick Mears and he is beginning to pull away from second place with 11 laps to go at the Indianapolis 500 the next time he comes around. Yes, he's Rick, Rick he's gonna... got 17 seconds on the nearest place behind him, closest one second place, and he's only got 15 laps left. And you can 11. see by the worried look on Chris Mears' face that it's as hard towards the end of the race, or even harder, than it is early in the race. From worry and worry about your driver going to finish. The driver sees, as we see, the relationship back to Emerson Fittipaldi. Beautiful shot as he comes down the pit straight. That shot from inside the track, of course, looking out. But when the driver sees those pit signals, he's also receiving the same information uh, via his radio. And when you, you have the visual confirmation of what you're doing and you hear it at the same time, it, it's a fantastic sense of being in control. And right now, if there's a problem that Rick Mears has, it will be that his emotions will rise up too much inside of him. You have to keep these things under control. You can watch Emmo as he went around that last turn, how well he's sticking. Emmo's been pretty good all day. It's like we said earlier, he's just been in too much traffic. 
but he isn't going to catch him on speed. It would have to be something untoward now. Agreed, Bobby? No, in he... fact, if there was a yellow, for example, and they bunched up, I think Rick still has the speed over Emerson, don't you? Oh, he certainly does. Yeah. Uh, Rick has had the speed over everybody with the exception of Danny. And of course, Rick had problems earlier on the race, as we've all watched, but he's in there now, and he's handling good. There's a fascinating perfection to the 500-mile distance, isn't there, Paul? I mean, we've seen so much go on through the race, and yet suddenly the dust is cleared, the stage is set, and the man that really has been fastest all month is pulling away in the Indy 500. A very clear view of the Indianapolis 500 now. Three men on the leader lap. Rick Mears has completed his 191st, just nine to go. Emerson Fittipaldi, 17 seconds back, and Jim Crawford rides in third place on the leader lap with Rick. Let's go to Jack Lee. Chris, how are the butterflies? Oh, they're, they're going by the minute. We have eight laps to go, and I just want to get this over with, and I want him to win the race. Well, that's the story from down here. Believe me, the butterflies are bullets. Back to you. Now, the question is, will Rick Mears become a three-time champion and join that rather elite group? And if he does, what does that hold in store for Rick Mears? He is, after all, only 36 years old. He holds the potential of being the first five-time winner of the Indy 500 or six-time winner. Three years ago, I made the prediction that when all the dust settled, uh, Rick Mears would be the great champion of Indianapolis, uh, that he would have more wins at the time he retired than anyone else. And of course, he's had it come very close a couple of times recently without managing to win the thing. Uh, but a third win today would start to make that possibility look uh, a more like a, a, a reality. You know, Roger Penske, great thing. What is he feeling right now? He says, I always come to Indianapolis as if I have never won it. So you're not saying, here's a man who's won it a, a number of times, and, and this is a business uh, as usual. He is going to be very, very excited that this car wins Let's remember, Sam, Emil Schlick could win this race. Looks like Mears is going to win it, no doubt. He's definitely the fastest, but Emil is in second place. He's charging hard. And when you look at Patrick and Pinsky in that team we just saw, you know, there's two of the old Biggie Carlos. Well, Bobby, I've got to point out to you, you just said it looks like he's going to win it, no doubt. More times than not, the man who leads at lap 180 does not win the Indianapolis 500. Statistics will bear that out. Rick Mears leads at the moment. Is it a 50th victory for the Penske crew? A third Indianapolis win for Rick Mears and for his chief mechanic, Peter Parrott. Already they've begun to assemble the area that the winner will pull into. But who will it be? Emerson Fittipaldi is in pursuit. Let's go to his pits now and Brian Hammond. So, Fittipaldi, what's going through your mind right now? Your husband's in second place. I can tell you how nervous I am right now, you know. I hope he finished really good. Can he catch Rick Mears? Yeah, I think so. She's confident she can, Paul Page. Well, now we're getting an entirely different piece of information coming from the officials of the race. They are telling us that they are going to assess the penalty that we have discussed against Emerson Fittipaldi after reviewing some information on that particular situation coming to the yellow there's pat patrick the car owner i'm not sure that he knows yet but this car will suddenly with a flick of the switch on a computer be transferred one lap back that bad for emerson fittipaldi but will be good for jim crawford who with that buick powered machine will move up into second place with just five laps to go for rick mears we started the race with three penskis on the front row of the grid one was eliminated when sullivan crashed al unser senior is dropped back and is not in contention one car is left did you see it right there all right let's go down to pat patrick's pitch well we are with pat patrick and he just found out that he has been the penalty will stand mr patrick what do you think well, I don't believe it. It's a typical USAC sanctioning body. It's yeah, screwed up. We're protesting. I'm not concerned about it. You think you can overturn it? Beg your pardon? You think you can overturn it? Oh, sure. Because he didn't pass out. The of second the place car, oh. Jim Crawford, is in the pits now. Second Where place is as a result of them moving Emerson Fittipaldi one lap down and back into seventh. So Jim Crawford is in the pits, and Al Unser Sr. comes by and picks up second place as they work on the left front of the car. Al Unser has moved into second place. It's now the Penske cars one and two at Indianapolis. Penske has won this race in 1972, in 79, in 81, in 84, in 85, in 87. 
and look on board Michael Andretti's car. The upper cover of the right side pod is blowing and trying to rip off of the car. Michael Andretti runs in third place right now. Here comes Jim Crawford roaring out of the pits. Bobby, I told you, it's not over until the checkered flag flies. And this race, while being dominated by Rick Mears, is still very active. Not that only that, oh, there there it goes. Goes. now that will cause With a it. yellow flag. Yup, yep. and, and they'll, they'll bunch up, and it'll be a trophy dash. Between yellow the flag. Two. Yep. We saw it. We anticipated. There's going to be a shame off on the main straightaway. The yellow flag comes out, and it's going to be a sprint to the finish of the Indianapolis 500. We are on lap number 197, just three to go. The Indianapolis seven and a half. <laughs> Seven and a half miles left to run. And it looks like if they can control the field properly, we may come back for a single lap run to the green flag. We've seen a two-lap run when Bobby Rahal passed with just five miles to go Kevin Kogan in 1986. Now, what will we see today? They're going to be awfully hard. There's two laps left, Paul. It's going to be awfully hard to pick up that piece, organize the pace car, get rid of all the equipment on the racetrack, go green so i have to guess at the moment the race may finish under the yellow two laps to go another part falls off the back of one of the trucks coming out to service this problem on the main straightaway so right now rick Mir is in that cockpit he's hovering between the emotion of thinking that he may be able to win this without really having to push anymore he'll win it under the yellow and realizing that if they can get the track clean fast enough he's going to have to drive it all out for his life for one lap rick mears right behind the pace car right behind rick is jim crawford but rick mears is well out in front So yellow flag with just five miles now separating Rick Mears from his third Indianapolis 500 mile race championship. Can they clear the track fast enough? And if they do, can anybody catch Rick Mears? Bobby, I suspect that you are right. It looks like Rick Mears can post now to his third Indianapolis 500 mile race win. Remember, Paul, we still worry about the cars on the yellow. That's when they develop the most heat inside the engines. He still could have a problem. We don't want him to. We certainly don't. But nonetheless, it could happen. You can tell by the look on Tinsky's face, by Chris's face. They're worried about the same thing. If you can see inside of Rick, he's worried about the same thing. Al Unser in second place. Jim Crawford now, they report. They can't make it to the green. Paul, well, we're 199 laps right now. So, effectively, the Indianapolis 500-mile race at 80 miles an hour for Rick Mears has come to an end. Rick always says that he thinks of his driving as a way that he can pay the crew back for the job that they've done, and listen to that crowd. Did you also see the way he almost waved them away? He said, don't clap for me yet. Don't clap yet. It's not quite over. And he's right. The 500 has never finished this way. It has finished under yellow with rain. The 199th lap being run out. Roger Penske holds his breath for one very long lap. Chris Mears stares down at the ground. Listen to the crowd. You never like to see a race finish under the yellow, but you can't say this hasn't been one of the nicest races we've ever seen, Paul. And you can't say that it wasn't decisively won by the man currently leading. You know what I mean? The yellow did not change the order of things. So on to the main straightaway, the fourth and final turn. The final lap now being completed. The pace car will actually see the checkered flag first. And there is the checkered flag alongside the yellow. Rick Mears has won his third Indianapolis 500, and Chevrolet has won at Indy. Rick is one happy person. Three-time winner. Another one of these. It group the three-time winner. Look at Trent. Pinsky. Pinsky just continues to set records. Rick Mears won the Indy 500, only the second time he ever raced here. What a prodigy of the Speedway. Second place in an amazing run, Jim Crawford. Third place, Al Unser, the defending champion. 
unofficially Michael Andretti being shown in fourth place and Bobby Rahal in fifth followed by Raul Boisel and Emerson Fittipaldi. But car number five, Rick Mears, has won the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Leonard Rick Mears wins it at an average speed of 144.8 miles an hour. We'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500 after this commercial and a word from our local station. Where can you find Jackaroot in victory lane, Rick Mears getting the congratulations of his crew. Rick, how does it feel, number three? Hey, what, it feels great. Uh, you know, they've asked me, you know, which one was the best of the first two and the second one was the best. And uh, I've got to say today that the third one's even better. I just, I can't explain it. The guys just did a tremendous job. Uh, we got, we had a little trouble, you know, and early on and got down lap. And that just shows how tough the guys were. They turned us around and got us going and got us back up that lap. And then even a lap above. So, you know, the thing just, the Chevrolet just ran beautiful all day. And the guys did a tremendous job. You know, they've said all month that you may very well be the perfect race car driver for Indianapolis. After this performance today, coming back from adversity, coming back up on top, what were your thoughts in the final couple of moments when you saw the yellow flag come out? Well, it, uh, you know, I, I knew that unless there was really something, we were so close to the end that, uh, you know, even if they went green, you know, we could go pretty good and pretty easy and, uh, and get it across. It was just a matter, when something like that happens, you hate to change your pace. You've got you to set rhythm going and and you even hate to start backing off when you've got a lead there at the end because you hate to change anything that's uh, the way you've been doing all day long. So it gets a little bit nerve-wracking. Then when you see that yellow like that, you think, oh, no, you know, it's, now here's another change. But uh, you're just hoping that, uh, you know, it doesn't change anything on the car. And it did, and everything worked great. Hey, you've been so laid-back, kickback California style all month here. Now, when are you going to finally let loose? Well, I'd say probably tonight. <laughs> I imagine that in the Penske team, there will be one whale of a party tonight, gentlemen. Maybe, now. Maybe right now. Let's go back up to you. So Rick Raven Mears has won his third Indianapolis 500-mile race. Rick Mears wins the Indianapolis 500. And for those of you who tuned in for the golf, well, it'll be coming up next. But for the moment, the celebration in victory lane as Rick Mears, at an average speed of 144 miles an hour, wins the Indy 500. Nanini in the Benetton waving his hands furiously at the start. Of course, that is the safety valve the starter has. He sees all the drivers. He has a clear view of them. If there's a trouble with one of the cars, they will be waving their arms. And of course, that is a no-go situation. So we do have a delay right off the start here in Mexico. They will try and get this field through another warm-up lap just as soon as possible. Okay, Chris, you seem to be the expert on rules around here. Yeah, I'll tell you, the Just rules... Just what happens now? The rules in Formula One racing are really complicated. Uh, there's a book of them. Uh, if the race is stopped, as I said before, the race actually started when they were waved off on the formation lap. So one lap of this race has been run, which means now that you, that you, you cannot... The green light is... Come on, you cannot make any changes. You cannot change cars. You can only do that if the race is stopped after two laps have been run. So they may be watching on. This was the problem that faced uh, Ayrton Senna in Rio de Janeiro when under these exact circumstances, he changed cars and was later disqualified. So down there at uh, Alessandro Nanini's car, that's the Benetton car uh, that he's driving. We're looking here at Philippe Alliot's Lowell. This is the car that crashed yesterday and so spectacularly and all of the parts flew off of it and it was remarkable, uh, uh, mark remarkable luck. Now, there are those tire warmers uh, that we saw, spoke about earlier going back on the tires to keep them up to an operating temperature. Formula One racing has become truly high-tech these days. It's really unbelievable how, how scientific it is. There they are, and these require tremendous amounts of electricity and to heat them up. every single one of these cars relies on Honda power because all those tire warmers, are the blankets are run off power, which is given by those little Honda... <laughs> Honda Motors, so uh, all these cars got Honda power. Okie doke, David. We'll be back for uh, more of the 11th Annual Mexican Grand Prix after these commercial messages. The man's feet is literally held together by pins and screws after a terrible accident here last May. This is his first race back, second place. Congratulations. Well, thanks very much. I'm, I'm happy for the Buick people that have, well, hey, we've done all those miles of testing and, and B, they stuck with me while I was injured, so... I feel very happy for them. They, they deserve it. What about your feet? Did you feel any pain out there? Uh, they probably hurt like hell, but I won't notice it for an hour or so now, I don't think. 
Were you ever competitive with Rick Mears? Do you think you could have caught him? No, he came past me early on in the race, and there was nothing I could do. I was using all the road and a bit, and that was all I could do. That was as fast as I could go, so, you know, my hat's off to him. He did a great job. One bad thing about it, your car owner, Kenny Bernstein, can't be here to enjoy it. He's racing himself down in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I hope he does better than me. <laughs> That's going to be awfully hard to do. Jim Crawford, a second-place finish in today's Indianapolis 500. Paul? Well, Brian, this was a scene just moments ago. As Rick Mears, for the third time, pulled into victory lane at the Indianapolis 500 to receive the Board Warner Trophy. The unofficial results to the moment. We'll be back with more right after this. Every Formula One Ferrari, every Ferrari 328, and every Ferrari Testarossa that comes to America comes on Goodyear Eagles. And only on Goodyear Eagles. Why? Because Mr. Ferrari wants it that way. Goodyear Eagles, Ferrari's choice as America's best tires. You know what smooth is? You gotta stop taste the high life. Smooth is the sensation of cracking open a cold Miller High Life. Smooth is the anticipation of that first mouthful hitting the back of your parched throat. Smooth is the feeling of a beer that goes down easy, never bitter. Stop and taste the high life. Smooth is knowing how good that first Miller High Life tasted and that it's time to enjoy another. Chevy's winning commitment to quality extends all the way from the finish line to the assembly line. Because at Chevrolet, quality is a way of life. And Rick Mears' victory at the 1988 Indy 500 proves it's a winning way of life. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, this two-and-a-half-mile oval, the roar of engines now complete. Rick Mears has won his third Indianapolis 500-mile race. 1979, 84, and now he wins once again as Rick Mears proves that he is a dominant race driver in the Indy cars. The giant crowd, well, many of them will stay for another hour or two. Others already have headed for the exits. They can report that they watch Rick Mears win his third Indianapolis 500-mile race. You can see many staying in the grandstands. Now we have an opportunity to look back over the month of May for the Penske team through the eyes of electronic artist Joni Carter. We'll take a look at that. And as we do, we'll also take a look at the unofficial results of the 72nd running of the 500. with the Chevrolet engine. <laughs> Just the whole team, because this is a, for sure a team effort from, from everybody. A magnificent month at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway ends with Roger Penske and Rick Moore Mears scoring yet 
another victory. Let's take a look at the unofficial results of the Indianapolis 500. Mears, Jim Crawford, his first race of the season. Now remember, none of these are official until 8.30 tomorrow morning when they are posted. You've already heard there is some controversy. Great finish for Phil Kruger. He has to be complimented. Kept with it all day. Ari Lyons-Eich and Dick Simon, oldest man in the race, rounds out the top ten. So the engines are quiet. The race is done. The Indianapolis 500 is over, and Rick Mears is the winner.